we'll make a start. So, good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to the eighth meeting in 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item, remind members to switch off mobile phones that might interfere with the sound system. Committee members will, of course, be able to consult tablets, as will witnesses, uh, for the matters according to their business at the meeting. We have a, an apology today from Claudia Beamish. Agenda item one is the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill, and uh, this agenda item is taking evidence on stage two amendments to the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill on the Crofting Community Right to Buy, as well as on the draft regulations on abandoned and neglected land. And I welcome Dr. Aileen MacLeod, uh, our Minister of for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform this morning with uh, her supporting officer Stephen Patharana, uh, the Deputy Director of Land and Tenancy Reform and Dave Thompson, uh, Land Reform and Tenancy Unit in the Scottish Government. So welcome Minister. I don't know whether you wish to make any short introductory statement. Um, yes, I do, Convener, okay. if that would be um, OK. Um, well, I'm delighted uh, to be invited to give evidence to the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee on my proposed Stage 2 amendments to the Community Empowerment uh, Scotland Bill seeking to amend the Crofting Community Right to Buy. And I'd like to thank the Convener, uh, Rob Gibson, and the members of RACI for agreeing to take on this not inconsiderable part of the Community Empowerment Bill on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. And I'd also like to thank all stakeholders who responded to the call for evidence on the proposed amendments and attended the meetings that my officials held in Edinburgh, Inverness, the Isle of Harris and the Kyle of Lacalche uh, during December last year. The evidence from those who participated has been instrumental in shaping the amendments. And uh, I strongly uh, believe that the crofting community right to buy is a tool which can be of great benefit to crofting communities and it's therefore vital that these amendments that introduce the much needed flexibility and simplification are introduced at the earliest opportunity. Now only two crofting uh, community bodies have made use of the crofting community right to buy legislation in over 10 years. However, we have heard at last week's stakeholders evidence session that even the existence of the legislation has helped to change culture by encouraging crofting communities to buy their croft land. And the framework of the legislation itself acts as a useful backstop to encourage the parties round the table to open negotiations. And indeed, earlier this month, the opportunity through the community of Barvis on the Isle of Lewis, over 80% voted in favour of a community buyout of the Barvis estate, and that's an estate that's contains in the region of 300 crofts. And that is why I strongly believe in the principles of the crofting community uh, right to buy, which is designed obviously to empower our crofting communities or to work as a backstop to negotiate a community acquisition that's out with the framework uh, of the Act. I do, however, recognise that there have been elements of the legislation which could cause uh, great difficulty to communities wishing to exercise their right to buy, not least the mapping requirements that communities are required to fulfil, which stakeholders highlight as being particularly onerous. So I want to make the legislation more flexible where necessary and more straightforward for communities uh, to use. I have listened to what stakeholders have told me and I am introducing a number of measures to address the flaws which have discouraged its use, including the mapping requirements and how the legislation is used to define a crofting community. So I'm happy to answer uh, questions that the committee may wish to answer, ask in response to the, these amendments. Thank you very much. I can assure you we have quite a number of questions. And uh, to start off with, uh, just thinking about your statement that it would make it easier uh, for crofting communities to use while at the same time continuing to strike a fair balance between the rights of landowners and crofting communities. Would you like to expand on this statement and indicate how many crofting communities you think might take advantage of the simplified process? Well, the proposed um, changes uh, will encourage uh, more communities to access 
the right to buy by simplifying uh, some parts of the Act and opening up more options for uh, communities in others. So, uh, for example, we've simplified uh, the mapping requirements, which has been put forward as one of the key areas of concern with stakeholders. We've also increased uh, the options for communities by expanding uh, the types of organisations that community bodies uh, can use within the Act, and that's to include uh, Scottish charitable and cooperated uh, organisations and also community benefit uh, companies. We've removed some of the burdens on communities, such as the need to provide auditing of accounts, as well as allowing for um, ballot expenses to be claimed under certain circumstances. And at the moment, uh, communities obviously have to fund uh, the ballot themselves. So I believe that all of these amendments taken as a whole will encourage communities to think about what they can do to sort of take responsibility for their own futures. In terms of the question about the number of communities um, that will take up this opportunity, I mean, it is difficult, uh, as you'll appreciate, to estimate, but even uh, with the Act as it stands uh, just now, I mean, many communities use the Act's existence, as I said in my opening remarks, to encourage dialogue uh, with owners, uh, leading to purchases out with the Act. And I do hope that the amendments will encourage uh, even more communities to follow their example. OK, I understand, uh, you know, the, the context. It's uh, something which does push uh, the envelope out so that more people can consider this matter. Well, in considering that, we need to define what a crofting community is. So Alec Ferguson would like to ask you a question about that. Yes, morning, Minister, um, and thank you for that, convener. Um, Section 71 uh, amends the definition of a crofting community and... Um, I think attempts to widen the, the definition of a crofting community, but in doing so, as we've learnt last week in particular, um, the, uh, by amending it in the way that suggested, um, it will include owner-occupier crofters who are registered in the registers of Scotland's crofting register within the definition of a crofting community, but it will not include those on the Crofting Commission's register of crofts. To uh, a complete outsider like me, that seems a very strange uh, omission. Um, and while we have been told that, that sort of capturing what is a crofting community in legislative terms is not easy, um, you know, oral evidence last week did suggest that the provision would produce uh, something of a distinction between the, those two definitions. And I really wondered if you could explain why you think it's appropriate to go down that route. Um, well, the proposed amendments um, obviously would amend the definition of a crofting community in section 71.5 to address those crofters who are excluded by the existing uh, legislation. And Alex Ferguson is quite right to say that the proposed amendment includes the owner-occupier crofters who are registered on the registers of Scotland's crofting register within the definition of the crofting community, but does not include those on the crofting uh, Commission's register of crofts at this point in time. Now, the reason for this is that although the Crofting Commission uh, do collect uh, this information, as Susan Walker, I think, from the Crofting Commission uh, said last week, they have no duty uh, to keep owner-occupier uh, details. Now, the Crofters Scotland Act 1993 sets out the information that must be on the register of crofts, and at the moment, this doesn't include the owner-occupier details. Now, the Scottish Government, we intend to work with the Crofting Commission, and we will consider bringing forward uh, legislative changes to include uh, owner-occupiers within the information that must be uh, included. But until that process has been completed, it's not possible to, in this bill, to rely on the register of crofts for the owner-occupier uh, information. And that's why it's proposed that Scottish ministers take a regulation-making power to expand the definition of crofting community at a later date. And such, a, such expansion could then include um, owner-occupier crofters who are registered in the Register of Crofts. I mean, I know that this needs to be carried out in a, a sort of in a two-stage process, using uh, the ministerial power to add the owner-occupier crofters who are recorded on the Register of Crofts at a later uh, date when a legal matter is addressed by the Crofting Commission. So, well, thank you for that, and I think you answered my, the second part of my question, which was, is the, is the purpose of the, the, the further powers that you propose to take to expand the definition of crofting in order to include 
later data when it is more guaranteed yes. to be correct, I guess, is the way to put it. So you've answered that. Thank you very much. Um, and another issue that was raised with us by Susan Walker of the Crofters Commission was that the proposals appear to have removed the residency requirement. And she raised an issue on that, um, on that point, uh, uh, on the grounds that could there be a situation whereby, um, if that is the case, whereby absentee crofters could influence the outcomes of a community ballot, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Um, on the issue of um, residency, I mean, yes, we have removed the requirement that tenants uh, must be uh, resident within uh, 16 kilometres uh, of the Crofton community and replaced it with a requirement that they either be tenants registered in the Crofting register or register of Crofts, owner occupiers registered in the Crofting uh, register. Now, there have been some issues with the distance itself in terms of just where the distance is measured from. So if it's in the middle of a, of a Crofting community or the edge, for example. So that's why we sought to simplify uh, matters in uh, keeping with the rest of the changes. And there are some concerns, as you quite rightly point out, uh, Mr Ferguson, that the removal of this distance element uh, could lead to an undue influence being uh, exerted by absentee uh, crofters who would be defined as being part of uh, the crofting community for the purposes uh, of the Act. Now, under the ballot rules, uh, there are two elements for um, demonstrating that the community supports the proposals uh, of the community uh, body. And first of all, is the majority of those voting are in favour. So these people must be uh, people of the crofting community. And um, the second is that the majority of the tenants who are tenants of crofts within the land that the crofting community has applied to buy are in favour. And to the best of our knowledge, there aren't any um, crofting communities where the majority of the tenant crofters are absentees, which is the only situation where any undue influence uh, could be asserted. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope I understand that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it seems to me that we're, uh, well, I just want to, to follow this point up. You know, I suggested last week that because we're moving to a map based register, the Crofting Commission register, as it is at the moment, that is uh, just a list, will eventually become redundant. So we're in a transition period. And Derek Flynn said that he looked forward to that and there was a lot of laughter around the room. Uh, so the problem we have is to know how accurate the lists are that are in the Crofting Commission's register. Could you just reassure us that you're happy that these lists are competent and up to date? You want to pick up that? Yeah. I mean, I, I am happy, but I'm going to hand over to... <laughs> to Dave to just to sort of talk through some of the detail around that. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you, Kabir. I mean, I just said that, that, that there's a transition period that we're in. Um, the register of Crofts is, if I get it the right way around, is the, is the, the existing one where the Crofting Commission collected. The, red, the Croft, sorry, the Crofting register is the old one. The register of Crofts is the new one, which is as we said last week, I think it could take up to 80 years to, to fully popula populate. So we, we do intend to include information from both those registers. At the moment, this is where the regulation-making power comes in, so that we ensure that the information on both those registers is recorded by the likes of the Crofting Commission as a, a, a duty or an obligation to do so, and not as information they collect in terms of, of, of making it um, as complete as they would like. So that's where the regulation making power comes in, so that we can then, once the Crofton Commission are collecting all the data we would like to see, we can then ensure that those people are all included in the definition of the community. Well, it's nothing like having that. an 80 year legacy ahead of you, you know. Uh, it's, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, sure, yes. certainly. Again, I. I stress the fact that I'm total outsider to crofting law and it is a complete mystery. Every time I look at it, I'm more confused. But what you just said to me sort of suggests that, that it makes all the more sense to use both registers in, in registering. And I, and I can't quite Thank see where, where there is um, somebody registered on the Crofting Commission's register of crofts that is safe, secure, and you know that it's the correct information. The amendment isn't going to take that ownership into account. And it just seems, as far as I can see, and it just seems very strange not to do so. 
Or am I too simplistic here? No, I mean, you're, you're correct in what you're saying. The, the, the difference is, is about the duty that the Crofton Commission have to collect details of owner-occupiers. At the moment, they collect it, but it's not a duty. So in theory, at any point, they could stop doing so. If right. we then rely on this bill on that as a measure of who is a Crofton community, we could be left in a situation where we're asking for information that isn't being collected anymore. What we want to do is impose that duty on the Crofton Commission to collect that information and then use the regulation making power to include that as part of the definition. And that, 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 that helps. That helps. helps. That helps. That helps. Yeah. Up. <laughs> we're to take forward with the Crofton Commission. Thank you for that. Right, moving on to Croftland mapping. Angus MacDonald. Thanks, uh, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, in your uh, opening remarks, you br briefly acknowledged uh, the, the issue of, of Croft land uh, mapping requirements. Um, now, the amendments uh, with regard to uh, Croft land mapping as, as lodged uh, repeal some of the existing mapping requirements. Uh, for example, all sewers, pipes, lines, water courses, etc. Um, now, oral evidence um, last week broadly supported the amendment, uh, and Derek Flynn stated that the transfer of ownership of a Highland Crofting estate is a massive problem because it tends to be a jigsaw puzzle with lots of pieces removed. Um, and Peter Peacock of Community Land Scotland also warmly welcomed the proposed changes. Um, however, SLE, uh, in written evidence, as you might expect, uh, said uh, they, they do not agree with the proposal as it will affect inter alia valuations and details of ownership. Um, are inter alia valuations and details of ownership likely to be affected by the amendment? And uh, can you clarify how a, a fair balance between the rights of the landowner and crofting communities will be ensured? Thanks for that. Um, well, we are maintaining the balance. So I'll start with your, your last question first. We are maintaining the balance that was there um, before. Obviously, we are just um, improving uh, the process providing greater flexibility for community bodies, you know, obviously trying to streamline and simplify the, commu the crofting community right to buy process in line with the feedback that we received from um, stakeholders. So landowners will still have the opportunity to put their views across, they'll still be entitled to compensation. So the factors um, that were there protecting landowners' interests um, are still um, going to be there. What we're trying to do, obviously, with the, the mapping requirements is that, you know, we some feel that these requirements may not be particularly onerous, referring to the fact that the information is that which is known to the applicant body or the existence uh, of which it is on reasonable, diligent inquiry capable of ascertaining. Now, this information is easier to obtain for like small areas uh, of land with less chance of technical errors in producing uh, such maps, but they are certainly thought to be particularly difficult for large uh, crofting estates. Now, the complexity of maps, which are far in excess of those required when submitting a first uh, registration to the Register of Scotland, it is often cited as a reason for community bodies not engaging uh, with the process in the first place. So the maps provided, um, obviously we're keen to make sure we're removing the complex element of having to include the details of sewers, pipes, lines, uh, water courses or other conduits and fences dikes, ditches or other boundaries, but the maps provided will still have to be sufficiently detailed um, to allow checks to be made against the ownership of the land uh, in question and later on in relation to the valuation of the land should the application be approved. Okay, thank you. I think that covers it. Uh, it's just good to reiterate that uh, the majority of uh, uh, the contributors to the evidence have broadly welcomed the amendments. Good, thank you. Um, well, we're moving on to identification of owner, tenants and certain creditors. Mike Russell. <coughs> thank you. Um, Scottish land and estates are broadly happy with this amendment. Uh, everybody else is somewhat unhappy with it, and particularly those who uh, are experts in, in crafting law. And you, you, I think, very correctly said at the beginning that the, the purpose of this bill is to empower communities, but it's also to remove barriers to... Uh, the, the transfer of assets, which has been beleaguered crofting for a long time. There's quite a considerable barrier still in these amendments, and I just want to, to, to put that to you. Um, I think the obvious change to come uh, might have been to put the burden on the owner, 
But as Derek Flynn rightly pointed out, crofting law is essentially dependent upon the owner being expected to do virtually nothing and the tenant being expected to do virtually everything. And if you put the burden on the owner, they may not respond to it. So I wonder if you have considered further simplification of this so that perhaps um, the requirement might be for the, uh, the crofting community body to use their best in, uh, the best of their endeavours, for example, to find out what the information is, um, or to make sure that it only relates to that material which is available publicly. Because there, is, there are sometimes difficulties in estate ownership that the, uh, the beneficial ownership of that estate might reside a very long way away and not be accessible to, to a community body that's trying to find out about it. Well, I think um, identifying the owner and the creditor um, is uh, important um, because of the simple fact that this is a purchase of land and the community need to purchase it from uh, someone. So the information is, is uh, Mr Russell quite rightly points out, is readily available from public sources. But if there is a situation where no owner can be um, identified, then the community can obviously refer the land um, to what's known as a QLTR um, for the consideration and the community body can then enter into uh, discussions about purchasing it from the QLTR. Now, in relation to um, owners of sporting uh, interests uh, and tenants, the community body need only identify these if they are purchasing uh, those tenancies and sporting rights um, separately uh, from the land uh, itself. But it is important to remember that given this is a compulsory uh, purchase of land, that an owner must be identified and it is readily available, that kind of information from the public sources. But obviously, as I said before, if the information, if the situation where an owner can be identified, then the community can refer that land to the QLTR. Can, can I just press a little on I think the issue is, is not so much that an owner cannot be identified. The effort to identify the actual ownership of a, a Highland estate can be pretty difficult. You know, the, the chain of ownership can be very complex. And I think the, the, the insertion of some qualification into this, either by, on the face of the bill or by means of guidance, that indicates what you have indicated, for example, that indicates that uh, best endeavour is expected to apply, that indicates, for example, that uh, publicly available information is what is being sought, uh, I think would be helpful. Because on the face of it, if you are a, a community body and you read that you've not going to, got to find out about um, ownership but also about creditors of one sort or another, this seems a pretty tall order if you're facing a, a, an ownership that might end up in, a, in an obscure island somewhere in the Caribbean um, or even possibly in a Swiss bank vault. Do you want to take that, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, it, it, there are situations where we're trying to find an owner is, is and can be quite a torturous process. I think that the, the aspect that we need to keep in mind is that an owner still has to be found to purchase land. It's a compulsory purchase. Yes, in some cases that is not easy. Um, but the bottom line, it, it still has to be done. Now, in terms of strengthening the guidance, we can certainly, and, and in terms of, of sources of that information, you know, the, 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 the right to buy team are always there to help the community through the process at any point and to, and to help. We, we, as part of the, um, the, the recommendations of the Land Reform Review Group, they recommended a community land agency or that, that could assist with this sort of thing as well. Now, that may be one of the remits. That's still out for discussion and still out for consultation this on that of course whole apply aspect. Only to ownership that applies to, uh, and I quote it, you in terms of standard securities, uh, over, over the land as well. So I am reading this correctly, that you are indicating that you, you, you think guidance could be issued that would deal with this so that the, 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 the burden of this was understood more accurately by the crofting community uh, and that therefore concepts such as publicly available or best of endeavours could be considered. To be honest, I'm not sure if we, if we can, how far we go in terms of what reasonable endeavours are in terms of finding owner, um, we'll have to do Best that. Endeavor. Consider I that. think we were warned off reasonable endeavour by Derek so yeah, yeah, sorry. and by the Gold Society, <laughs> I think, quite firmly. Yes. Be clear for the point we yes. were warned of best, best endeavour, endeavour and best warned endeavour. into reasonable and endeavour. And suggested that reasonable endeavour, because, as Duncan Bird said, uh, uh, as may be disclosed to neither the Register of Seasons or the Land Register of Scotland, okay, 
but that's in order to lock down who should be within the public knowledge and to avoid the fraudsters. So reasonable would probably fit the bill. Okay. Yeah, we're, Is we're, that going to be reflected either happy. on the face of the bill or in the regulations? We're happy to take that away and, uh, and consider that. So that would be helpful because clearly you know, that would be an impossible yeah. further amendment. Yeah, I mean, the only other point I was going to make, Convener, is just to say about the registers of Scotland. Obviously, you know, it has a, a commitment to get you know all the land onto the register within the next um, ten years, and we are looking at a sort of full modernisation of the land register. But obviously, that's not happening now. <laughs> but that is in the long, you know, in the long term. But we're very happy to to have a look at that and and uh, come back to you. Thank you. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're looking at ballot procedures now, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and good morning, Minister. The proposed amendments would get us into a situation where Crofton community bodies could, in certain circumstances, seek reimbursement of the costs associated with conducting the ballot. However, no such option is made available under Part 2 of the 2003 Act to a community body. Could you outline why we have this uh, differential treatment? Well, in a, a Part 2 um, application with the community body uh, register uh, preemption uh, to buy, they have to demonstrate uh, community support for the group's plans by other means such as a petition. However, when it comes to uh, purchasing the land, uh, a ballot must be held to confirm that the community uh, wish to go ahead with the purchase itself. Now, for the Crofton community uh, right to buy, since it is a compulsory purchase, it goes straight into the purchasing stage uh, of the process. Therefore, it's important uh, that they demonstrate community support uh, for the purchase. So the requirements are the same in both parts as far as the ballot uh, is concerned. It's just that there is no preemptive um, element along with the associated uh, petition to demonstrate support. So the main difference is around the funding for the ballot. So as part of the changes to the community uh, right to buy, we are proposing that the running of the ballot and the cost of doing so is met by Scottish ministers. However, in the Crofton community right to buy, we're proposing that the community uh, run and fund the ballot in the first uh, instance, but in certain circumstances, they can apply uh, to Scottish ministers for the costs uh, to be Refunded, and the main reason for that is around um, one of timing, because in the part two process, um, community support has already been demonstrated uh, as part of the application process before the ballot stage is reached. So that also means that the Scottish government has already assessed the um, suitability of the community body's application. Okay, right, right that clears it up. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now moving to reference to the land court. Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, Minister, and uh, Dave and uh, Stephen uh, as well. Uh, this is a relatively minor point in some sense, as it was raised last week, uh, principally by the, the Law Commission, <coughs> and it's about the persons who have a right to refer a question to the land court. And the amendment that come forward uh, from yourselves, from the government, um, has extended that, um, but <coughs> what the Law Commission was saying is that, Law sorry, Law Society, sorry, sorry, uh, convener, the, the Law Society is that um, creditors should also have this right to refer. Now, there was a submission to us from a member of Community Land Scotland who made the point that creditors with a standard security and right to sell the land are irrelevant in a Part 3 situation because land in crofting tenure is near valueless. No other um, member of the panel seemed to be particularly exercised by it. So it was just to, to ask you why creditors in Section 81, they're included in Section 73, why they're not included in Section 81, if there's any particular reason for that, or is there any merit in what the Law Society are suggesting? Um, thanks for that. Um, what I will say to you is that Section 81C um, does actually state within it that any person who has an interest in the land, which is uh, legally, um, legally forcible, um, so that would include creditors. Okay, so that's the answer. Yeah. They're included in that broader yeah. uh, part of it. Okay, well, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we'll move on to uh, 
the outcome of an appeal to the Land Court. Jim Hume. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener and uh, Morning Minister and officials. Uh, yeah, uh, outcome of appeal to the Land Court. At, at the moment, the 2003 Act allows the Land Court four weeks from hearing date to give reasons regarding evaluation appeal. Uh, the amendments here in section 92 would make that eight weeks, but with the uh, Land Court also able to uh, report why it was unable to meet the eight weeks uh, target. I just wonder what the rationale of uh, doubling the time that the Land Court and therefore doubling the time that people have to wait, uh, doubling that time uh, is beneficial. Uh, as surely land courts, if they're given double the time, they'll take double that time. I just wonder what the rationale is. Well, one of the firstly. amendments that we have made is to allow for um, cross representations. And, you know, at the moment, either party is entitled to submit representations to the value, which must be taken into account. And it was felt that to ensure that all relevant information is taken into account, that where one party has submitted representations, um, the other party should be entitled to submit uh, cross-representation. So we don't wish to extend uh, the process on duly as a result. So we have imposed a short two-week period, so that's extended from the six week to the eight weeks, for them to consider the initial uh, representations and then to submit uh, cross-representations should they wish to do so. In terms of what the, the Land Court, when I mean, the Land Court requested that the four-week um, time limit be extended as it can often cause um, scheduling issues, particularly with complex cases, and it was felt that it was unlikely um, that a case which has been heard over a number of weeks could be written up in four weeks. But you know, we also realised that um, both community bodies and owners need an element of clarity uh, in when they might expect a decision. So whilst the time limit has been um, extended and the court has the ability uh, to request that it be extended further, they must then give a definite date uh, by which a written decision will be received. Okay, th uh, th thanks for that. Uh, I'm just wondering what sort of sanctions are available if they don't uh, actually meet the, that uh, eight-week target? And well, how, how do you ensure that the Land Court does report? I mean, whilst there is, um, there are no powers obviously to impose um, s sanctions, um, should the court not adhere to the timescales uh, in the Act, it was felt that it was still important to specify these to give all parties a degree of um, certainty as when they can reasonably expect a decision. And it's not expected that the court will miss these deadlines except in extenuating circumstances. So, so there, uh, there is actually no sanctions if they don't meet that? They... No. 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 Okay, thanks. Graham Day. Uh, just by, uh, by way of information, do you have any figures on how many um, times the Land Court would or, or do you have any anticipation of how many times the Land Court would miss this target? Um, we don't, um, but I'm happy to take that away and come back to the committee in writing with that information. Okay. I don't can have I, it on with me at the moment, but I'm very happy to um, ask officials if we can have a look into that and thanks for write that, to the committee to with a response. Indeed. Um, can I add to that question about whether there are enough uh, members of the bench in the land court to be able to cope with the work in hand uh, because the question about the time that it takes for them to hear uh, these cases may be tied up by as been suggested to us a couple of members being mm -hmm. in south uist dealing with a case there should we be recommending that in fact they there should be more members of the land court i mean the 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 changing in the time scales was um arrived at through discussion with the land court themselves and, and they were quite happy on that extension from 48. They didn't ask for a further extension to take account. To be fair, we didn't ask them about whether they needed to increase the number of members on the bench for the land court. It was about their, their schedule and timetables and what they would reasonably expect to be able to, to comply with, which is why we don't, you know, they've given us no indication that they're going to miss that eight weeks. I mean, up to now, they've, they, they have by and large, as far as we're aware, and this is what we'll go and check, met the four weeks, but in some cases it's been difficult. So this is just to give the, the, the court themselves a bit more time to make sure, but still including some degree of certainty for both communities and the owners of when they can expect that decision rather than just whenever, you know, when manana. So it get, it, there's no important sanctions to, to enforce that, but at least it, it puts some sort of a, a framework. 
Jim Hume, is that okay? Yeah. It's okay, that's, that's okay, fine. Uh, mediation, Dave Thompson. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, uh, I'm sure you're aware, Minister, that Scotland's developing a very strong uh, mediation reputation, and, and there are many um, good mediation services out there now, uh, which I think we need to uh, encourage. Uh, and I know the government has been involved uh, in this. What I'm just wondering is that um, whether uh, the government does actually have the, the legal power to um, insist on mediation in relation to disputes uh, in relation to this legislation. Um, we got evidence from Community Land Scotland that a number of the agencies that support community groups uh, would like to be able to facilitate mediation, but they don't have the legal power at the moment. Um, and it's something, I think, that could speed up um, you know, resolution of disputes. Uh, it's, I'm not sure what the position of most lawyers would be. It's maybe going to do them out of some work. But, never, but the other side is lawyers can get involved in mediation as well. And, and I just think that mediation is something we should be moving towards generally throughout all of the legislation and everything that we do in Scotland and we should be encouraging it at every step. So I'd like a wee bit of clarification as to how you see mediation working in relation to this legislation and whether you have the power to uh, ensure that people can access mediation to resolve disputes much more quickly than they would through the, the land court. Um, well, it's obviously uh, recognised that the majority of uh, crofting community purchases have you know, taken place out with the Act using a negotiated settlement between um, both parties. Now, you know, as we know, these negotiations can often be um, difficult, and it is recognised that there may be a need for support um, for this. And at the moment, the Scottish Government is um, forming a short-life working group as part of the work on achieving um, the one million uh, acre target for community ownership. And this work will be informing um, the potential functions and role of a community land agency, which was one of the recommendations of the Land Reform uh, Review Group, and one of the functions of which could be to assist um, with uh, mediation. Now, obviously, mediation is voluntary, and it's thought that investigating um, the options through this route and um, would allow for a much better consideration of the issues and the best solution. In terms of the point that you raised, um, Mr Thompson, around um, the legal powers, um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure, um, but we can check and we can get back to the committee um, about that point. Well, that, that's very helpful, Minister. Um, yeah, obviously it, 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 it would be voluntary, I suppose, but if, if, the, if it's made clear in the legislation that, that you know, mediation would be favoured and that the community bodies who are assisting, uh, the, the, um, you know, the, the ones that support community groups, you know, would actually have the power to suggest and push people towards mediation rather than just leave it as a kind of ephemeral type of, type of thing. So I, I appreciate your, your uh, response and I look forward to... Um, hearing, you know, what you come back to us with once you've checked out. Uh, OK. Yeah. Thank you. We're moving out of the area of the crofting community bodies and into the general uh, community empowerment aspect now about abandoned and neglected land. And Sarah Boyack is going to lead off. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, thank you for sending us um, the draft regulations on this part of the bill, Minister, it's been incredibly helpful. Um, I'm going to start off the questioning. I'm sure I'm not going to be the last member to ask questions in this section because in the committee, uh, we spent quite a lot of time discussing this issue before we came to our stage one report. And that was partly the weight of the evidence that we received from some of the key stakeholders, but also in terms of the policy intent of the bill, um, the policy memorandum um, is clear that the objective that you as a government have is to enable land that's neglected or abandoned um, can be a barrier to the sustainable development of the land and that the objective of the bill is to enable communities 
um, to have the opportunity to buy that land when other routes to getting access to its better use have failed. So in this context, um, the fact that neglected and abandoned is mentioned on the face of the bill, but sustainable development isn't, um, we have concerns about. So I want to kick off um, the questions today about the definition of neglected and abandoned. And in the response back to us, um, Minister, you said that neglected and abandoned took their ordinary meaning and that it's not to be defined on the face of the bill. Um, and that, you know, if I can paraphrase, it's basically obvious to everybody what the terms neglected and abandoned mean. And I suppose the worry I have is that actually it's not that straightforward, whether it's an urban and a rural area. Um, everybody says that it's obvious in an urban area, it's not so obvious in a rural area. And having represented an urban area for quite a while, even in that context, meeting the definition of whether land or just um, illustrating whether land has been neglected or abandoned is not necessarily straightforward. Now, you've said that there will be, um, in the regulations, circumstances will be um, set out. But for a community to establish that something is neglected, for example, what about minor works that might have taken place in the land? Um, what about works just to make a building safe and secure, um, but not necessarily used? Or whether planning applications are submitted on a regular basis? So there, there are questions about the issue of abandonment and neglect and how bad it has to be before ministers would take that into consideration. But the fact that we don't have that defined on the bill, but that also, although the policy ambition is to achieve sustainable development, that doesn't appear on the face of the bill, is a concern. So I'd first, first of all like to open up by um, saying what you thought of the representations we made in our committee uh, report and why to date you haven't felt able to take them on board in terms of putting the statutory definition on the face of the bill and using the word sustainable development as you have in the policy memorandum. Um, perhaps, um, Kavina, if I can just make some, maybe some general points around first um, around um, the draft um, regulations. Um, I will sort of say at the outset as well that when it comes to um, the draft uh, regulations um, themselves, that these, um, when they, at the moment, they're illustrating the sort of thing that could be put into the draft uh, regulations and we're trying to bring clarity to neglected and abandoned land and we've been trying to take on board um, the committee's uh, concerns around that but also you know if the committee's got any further um, suggestions uh, or ideas around what else could be into the draft regulations then I'm very happy um, for the committee to be able to um, feed that into uh, the government at this uh, stage. Now the introduction of um, Part 3A, which is the right for communities um, to buy land which is abandoned or neglected, even against the wishes of its current owner, um, is a very uh, important step, you know, because it allows land that is neglected or abandoned to be brought back into productive uh, use while ensuring that it is developed in a sustainable way for the benefit of the community. Now, I accept that's not as big a step as some would hope for, but it is um, it is an important one because it will allow communities uh, with clear plans for neglected or abandoned land to make a case for um, community ownership. Um, and it's, there is an example of, um, for example, Cunnagar Loop, um, which is not exactly the same thing, but it gives a sort of example of the sort of opportunity of the change that can be made uh, to the land. And this is where the Forestry Commission has brought into use a derelict site at the heart of the Clyde Gateway area, creating an inspiring and accessible uh, Riverside Woodland Park. And it is located in the boundary between South Lanarkshire Council and Glasgow City Council. But as I say, that is, it's not exactly the same thing as, as I say, as abandoned or neglected, but it is an example of the kind of opportunity that communities could make to change um, the land for the, um, the better, you know, with this power in relation to abandoned neglected land. So not only is this new proposal a demonstration of the government's ambition to further community empowerment is also another step along Scotland's land reform agenda. Now, we have um, listened very carefully to uh, the committee's concerns and also those that have been raised by the stakeholders. We have taken uh, legal advice on whether the amendments could be made to the face of the bill to address the concerns raised by the committee in their stage one 
uh, report. There are several aspects that we must take into account when deciding what goes on the face of this bill, because we need to ensure that the amendments to the bill are within the competence of the Scottish Parliament, and this includes ensuring that the amendments comply with the ECHR, which provides a right to um, peaceful enjoyment uh, of possessions. And we also need to make sure that the right to buy will be compatible and it is in accordance with the law and pursuing a legitimate aim in a way that is um, proportionate. I mean, obviously, I want to be as helpful um, as I possibly can um, to the committee in understanding the legal context. But we have to... Um, we will actively consider whether amendments can be made to the definition of eligible land to include land that isn't neglected or abandoned that still is causing problems. Thank you very much. I think that's um, really helpful. I was thinking specifically about the issue that's been raised um, by quite a few stakeholders about the term sustainable development. Um, and I note your comments about um, legal force and legal understanding. But sustainable development is something that has been used. It regularly appears in Scottish Government bills. Um, and if we have the terms neglected and abandoned, um, and the objective is to ensure sustainable development is, is seen in the use of the land, um, what could be the legal objection to that? Because it's a term understood. It's now being used in the courts. Um, I'm very much... Uh, welcome the fact that this is a step on the way to ensuring sustainable development use of the land and very much um, support the Scottish Government's intentions here. The, the worry is that without um, clear definition and without the term sustainable development being put on the bill, that actually that might cut across the ambitions that you have in the policy memorandum to make the difference in many of our communities. I'm going to ask um, Stephen to come in at the moment. Thank you, Minister. Um, so a, lo a lot of this depends on how e e exactly what is changed within the, you know, in, in terms of the drafting at present. So the proposals at the moment relate to neglected and abandoned land. And if we were, depending on what, based on the committee's report, to remove neglected and abandoned land from the face of the bill, that would be a complete change of scope of the proposal that would move it beyond neglected and abandoned land to all land, which is completely a completely different uh, proposal in its own right. And obviously, whenever you, whenever you make such a fundamental shift, you have to sit down and think very carefully about all the checks and balances that are in place that make legislation compliant. And, and, and that, that is what, you know, that is a, a, a different, a new proposal. Now, there is obviously within within this proposal it does have a focus on sustainable development in the context of what the community's proposals are to do with the land so when when you say you know bringing sustainable development onto the face of the bill if it's if it's a replacement to if, if it's about what the community want to do as opposed to the condition of the land that's a fundamental shift in scope of the of the proposal which changes its meaning so just briefly as a supplementary as a, a reassurance um, if you were to be able to define um, neglected and abandoned on the face of the bill, wouldn't that go some way to reassuring the communities who are worried that the test of, of neglected and abandoned might cut across land that you actually, as a government, would, would hope would be given that sustainable development use? Well, one, we, we thought very hard about, you know, what well, we have, when well, we continue to think very hard about you know, the, the merits of defining neglected and abandoned on the face of the legislation. I think any, any attempt to define it would invariably n narrow the definition. And broadly speaking, I think the question the committee are interested in is how broad can, broad can the land that's eligible be made? And, and what the minister was saying earlier is that we, 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 would, we, we are thinking about is there any scope to go beyond abandoned and neglected to other land that ha that, for which there are problems? So we need to look at whether we can come forward with amendments of a nature that would take it further than it is at present, but at the same time not extend it to all and any land in Scotland. Um, and again, while not, not, making, while not defining it on the face of the bill, the, propose, the, the idea that we bring forward regula a, a regulations that set out what 
issues ministers have to have consideration to helps define what we mean by neglected and abandoned land. And obviously that has greater flexibility in a way because um, if, if, it, if it's found not to be working quite as well as Parliament wants, it can also be amended in time as well. It's more flexible, whereas if we define it on the face of the bill, then it makes it very hard to, to, to make changes to it in time. Russell and then Dave Thompson, OK? And Andrea <laughs> I think and then Rob Gibson. This is a very important discussion we're having, and, and okay. I think you know, we're all trying to get the right solution out of it. And I think it might be helpful just to step back for a moment and say, what is that right solution? And the right solution is to enable communities to possess, to buy land, uh, which they wish to use for purposes of sustainable development. Um, now, if we get this wrong one way or the other, then that's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because it will be frustrated by lawyers who want it not to happen and owners who don't want to sell. So we need to get a clarity in this that means if the bill is challenged, then you know, judicial review does happen and reference under ECHR could happen. But if we do not get it right, then this will be the clause that stops communities actually participating because they will be frustrated by it. So the question is, is it better to define it on the face of the bill and have it challenged, but at least be absolutely clear what it means, or to leave it in what you euphemistically call, ordin their or the given the words, their ordinary meaning, though it's capable of many ordinary meanings, and another legal meaning. And that's really quite worrying, because there's a specific legal meaning to abandon neglected land, which you are not applying here. And in those circumstances, if you leave it in that way, will the challenges essentially be successful because of the vagueness within the leg legislation? And I think the committee, in the greater part, you know, it's not unanimous, but the committee in the greater part believed that it was very important that we tied this definition down as clearly as possible so that communities could use the legislation effectively. Now, I think that's what we're still struggling, struggling to try and do. I think there's also an issue about whether fundamental and radical steps, and you know, I'm very, very pleased to see them, but fundamental and radical steps about changing land ownership should really be defined in secondary legislation or whether they should be defined quite clearly as a legislative intention of the Parliament within primary legislation. So I don't think we're there yet. I think the regulations are helpful, but I do think it's important that we get a clearer definition on the face of the bill. And what Sarah has been trying to do, and I think quite correctly, is to point to sustainable uh, development as one possible area in which we could get a clearer definition. But I think that there will be amendment brought forward on this. And I would urge the government to think about that, in a, because I think we're all trying to help each other to get that absolute clarity so that the intention for a radical step forward will be fulfilled in practice. Because we know from the land reform legislation that in actual fact many of the difficulties that existed, including some I have been dealing with myself in, in recent weeks, are because the legislation is not as clear as it should be and that there are difficulties in operating that legislation. Now, we've learned from that. So the question is, can we keep moving in this legal debate? And my own contribution to it, uh, convener if I might just make that, is I do think we need the clear definition. I do think we need the term sustainable development. And I think some of the work that is being done by Community Land Scotland to suggest a way to frame it should be seriously considered by the government's lawyers going forward. I mean, there will, I think, be an amendment at stage two. And it, you know, if that amendment were to be seriously considered by the government's lawyers, we might get ourselves to the stage where we could all eventually agree. Thank you. I'm just going to add very um, quickly onto that, just obviously that um, we appreciate um, the committee's support and the committee's work around this area, and obviously we are actively considering what's possible from the government side um, as well, because obviously, you know, Within the land reform bill consultation itself, it does also ask the question, you know, do you agree that there should be powers given to Scottish ministers or another public body to direct landowners to take action to overcome um, barriers to sustainable development uh, in an area? And obviously, um, the responses to the consultation are currently being um, analysed, but you know, say there is uh, work that we are currently doing right now to, in terms of considering what further amendments could be brought forward. So when the amendments do come forward, uh, you, and it's very helpful. I'm grateful to you, Minister, for that. You are essentially saying that the debate can continue. You know, obviously, you will look at possible amendments and keep thinking about how we can make this effective 
so that it doesn't stand as a difficulty, but actually fulfills what your policy intention yeah. is, which is endorsed by the majority of this committee, very warmly endorsed by the majority of this committee. Yes. Uh, Dave Thompson. Uh, thanks, convener. Look, looking at this, it strikes me that the, the broader the definition, you know, as outlined by Stephen Patrana there, uh, the more room there is for challenge, um, which is counter to what you were actually saying. And I think it's interesting if you look at the people who are happy with the current proposal, and they are the ones, I think, who don't want change in relation to communities' rights to uh, buy the land. And I think that's very, very significant. Look at the folk who are supporting this change and look at the folk who are quite content with the current Situation. So that's really a, a comment to kick off with. But th there was one thing you said, Minister, which I'd like to get a wee bit of clarity on, and it was to do with the legal advice, um, where you mentioned the competence of the Parliament and the ECHR. Um, and if it was in the face of the bill, there would be greater difficulties and problems for us. What I don't understand, and I'm not a lawyer, so maybe uh, Stephen can help me with this. Uh, if, if that is going to create problems, if it's on the face of the bill, what leads you to think that these problems wouldn't exist if it appears later in regulations? What's the difference, you know, in, in these two things? What makes you confident that you can do something in the regulations that you feel you can't do on the face of the bill? I, I think... So, firstly, I'm not a lawyer either, so let's get that right. back clear. <laughs> my apologies. Um, so, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to try and answer, because I, I think there is some confusion here still about the different things we're talking about around this proposal. So there's the issue of what type of land are we talking about, which is what, and the words neglect in the band relate to the land. Then there's the issue about, you know, does the community have a proposal and a case to take ownership of that land. Yeah, so those are, those are different things. So, so if we're talking about what type of land, the question of the definition is what definition, you know, what definition describes the land we, land we mean now? The, 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 my initial understanding of what the committee was suggesting, which was possibly removing the words neglect, abandoned and neglected, would then mean all land. Now, all land is very, very different to a specific class of land. And even when we talk about um, crofting communities, it's a specific type of land, a specific type of land with specific sets of rights that already reside over it, so it's different to other land. So we need to be clear about what, we, what, what land we're talking about, and what we're trying to do with neglect and abandoned is describe the land. And while I accept that, yes, we are talking about the, 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 normal, definition, the normal definition of neglect and abandoned, which ultimately there will, will be you know, uh, you know, with all with all legislation that's groundbreaking, cases that define it. But we anticipate that that definition would probably be broader than any definition that we would articulate, because invariably, when you start trying to articulate things, you end up narrowing them down. So that that's a that's a risk. You know, we could define it down, but it will be narrower than wider. Now, what we what we what we can't what, what would be a substantive change in direction of the proposal would be relating the issue of sustainable development of communities as the key factor that drove the the which land was eligible if you see what I mean so i.e communities so deciding so that's that's actually a huge a huge change and it's not that uh, and essentially within the context of the current proposal which where all of, all the checks and balance have been carefully thought through in relation to neglect and abandon that that would all have to be thought through again and you know you could argue that you know within the context of the consultation on land reform where we're talking about uh, consulting on a proposal for the power to minister, minister to intervene where the actions of landowner are detrimental to the sustainable development of communities we're thinking about to go to go to the place the committee is really interested in in that context which of course requires a lot of a lot of careful thought about how you design um, a mechanism that's compliant and takes regard of landowners and communities' interests. And, and for, from a landowner's point of view, 
It has to be adequately foreseeable. They have to understand what they have to do that would make their land, bring their land back into good use, make it, make it sustainable. And if we, if we make a shift like that, that's, that's, a, that's just a huge change at this stage in the, in the process. So while I think this, we, you know, we, we can go away and look at scope to bring greater clarity to neglect and abandoned and scope to extend it to other land that, for which there are problems, extending it to all land is a, is a, is a, is a bigger step. Just one uh, little follow-up to that, convener. That, that's very helpful. That's very useful. Um, and apologies for uh, calling you a lawyer. Uh, if, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> the the the, um, the committee, uh, 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 as as we said, um, had proposed taking it um, out altogether. But I, I can see there might be arguments for leaving it in. But let, let's take that as, as, as the case uh, and it keeps it tight and it doesn't extend it to all land so I fully understand that point but doesn't it logically follow that if you have the uh, neglected and abandoned land there on the face of the bill that to strengthen your hand even more the definition on the face of the bill would actually do that especially if the definition made it clear that the whole purpose of this was to do with sustainability and sustainable land. So rather than have neglected and abandoned on the face of the bill, which clarifies that it's a tight sort of definition in a sense with the regulations following, it would actually strengthen the bill and make it very, very clear to everybody if we also had the sustainable development aspects on the face of the bill as well then you're really defining it and you're really being much more precise. Am I not right in that? I think it's possibly, that would, that would possibly be, well, certainly putting a, putting a clear definition on the, on the face of the would be more precise, but it would invariably probably be narrow. But it would have to relate to the land, so sustainability of the land and the condition of the land, as opposed to the sustainable aspirations of the community, which are uh, a different thing. So, and again, you know, that's the, the, there's a big difference in that. And I, I, th I still think the, 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 you know, the scope in, in terms of regulations, which allow greater flexibility to get this right over time in a way that going for a definition on the face of the, the, the bill will, would obviously pin yeah. it, may pin it down, but offer less flexibility. Really. Yeah, I, I take that point, but, but the whole purpose of this is to ensure that land is used to its best advantage, it's just, you know, that sustainable development of land is actually taken forward. And there isn't land lying there doing nothing, um, not benefiting anyone other than someone who has bought it as an investment. Uh, and therefore, yeah, it's got to relate to the sustainable development of the land, that's fine, but that's going to be in the interest of the community. And if there's a bit of land lying doing nothing, and the community would like more housing or, or business parks or, or, or hydro schemes or anything like that, and that land's lying there just because somebody's bought it as an investment to hedge against inflation or, or, or whatever, then the community would be able to come in and argue that this land is not being used sustainably. They have a way of making sure that it would and they would come out with their business plan and all the detail along the lines of the, the park judgment, for instance. So, yeah, it's got to be to do with the sustainable development of the land, but uh, it would definitely... And, and that's what we're after. So I'm quite comfortable with that being in the face of the bill and that being made clear in the face of the bill because that's what we're looking to do. Uh, in the Highlands, there's lots of land that is sterilised uh, and not being used to best effect, uh, and we need to change that. So can I come back on one small point? Can we Briefly, yeah, because it's, it's a debate. Yeah, so I mean, Alec Ferguson wants to come in and Mike wants to come in and so do I. So what, one of the things in, the, in these provisions is they don't apply to the crofting, to, to the crofting communities, sorry, to the crofting um, districts, or because because essentially the crofting community right to buy 
is a broader right to buy mm -hmm. and would apply in those areas. So all those situations you're talking about in the Highlands that you point to, the Crofton community right to buy is the vehicle in, the, in, in that place. But, but not all of the Highlands is under Crofton tenure. Mm -hmm. Only some yeah. districts, yes, indeed. Yeah. Right, Alec Ferguson, Mike Russell. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, I, I just wanted to thank Mr. Patharana for, for confirming, I think, that the committee's recommendations um, in this area would, would effectively have brought in an absolute right to buy for all land, which is what's creating the difficulty. Well, I think he said it would open up, you said it would open up the pro possibility of this right to buy covering all land. Is, is that right? If, if, if the words neglected and abandoned, if, if we don't define land as a, a definition around land, then effectively we're talking about all land. If, 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 we, if, you, if you did as the committee recommended, that would be the case, I think, is what you were... If we remove the definition of a bet, yeah. uh, neglected I mean, I just, and abandoned... I just wanted, I wanted to thank you for clarif that clarity, because that's why I dissented from this section of, of the report. But my question is to really to the Minister. I wonder if you could confirm that it remains the government's intention that this right, this power, should only be used as a, in a situation of last resort when all other processes have failed. Does that remain your intention? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it, is. it does. Thank you. Yes. That's all I need so to know. Much. Thank you. I, I, I feel I perhaps should have come in before Alec, because what I wanted to say to Stephen is that I don't think the committee's intention was that it should apply... Uh, the, the recommendation of removing the words should open up all land to purchase. I can see that the logical inference of the decision might be that, but that wasn't the committee's intention. And I think I'm right in saying that in terms of the recommendation from the discussion that took place. The committee's intention was to make sure that the opportunity to purchase land that is, inverted commas, abandoned and neglected, uh, was fulfilled. But getting the definition of that has proved to be very difficult. Right? But I don't think there's any intention to open it up for all lands. Some might argue that's the right thing to do. I mean, uh, and, you know, that's another debate. But that's not the intention. The intention is to fulfill the policy intention that the government has, and the, the debate is about whether or not a definition of those words is required to do so, um, and that's what we should focus on. There isn't intention to go f wider. And I think if that became the debate, as you have just seen, that would not necessarily help the government get its intention. So perhaps it would, isn't the road, road to go down in terms of criticising what the committee did. OK, you're, yes. you, you've uh, taken that right. Well, I want to, to just focus specifically on the fact that we're talking about eligible land for a start. It's been mentioned before. Eligible land excludes things like agricultural land that's being kept in good condition. It, it, it removes low-intensity use land that's been agreed, etc. So anything to do with abandoned and neglected is about a limited amount of land. It's not about uh, all land. Would you just confirm that, please? Um, yeah, that's set out in the draft regulations where we set out the matters to which we must have regard when deciding whether land is um, eligible and obviously they fall into the three broad uh, categories, which are the physical condition uh, and its effect on the surrounding area, public safety and the environment, the use of the land or lack of use, as the case may be, including whether the land is a nature reserve held for conservation purposes or used for public recreation. And thirdly, is the third category is around any um, designation or classification of the land, such as land which has been classed as contaminated land or buildings which are listed buildings or scheduled monuments. So, thank you for that confirmation. Uh, and it's a good explanation of uh, areas in which there should be some discretion so that assessment can be made. I think you should be aware that whatever uh, arrangements are finally agreed by the Parliament, that uh, those who have a landowning interest, uh, as has been mentioned by you on a couple of occasions, will cite the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and in an article in this month's uh, Scottish Field, a 26-page uh, assessment of making sense of land reform, it states that, the editor, Richard Bath, states that, but it is almost inconceivable that any reform will not be challenged legally. So we're in the world where whatever move is made, we can expect that there will be some means found to challenge whatever we decide in court 
That's the reality. If that's so, we're moving into an area where uh, you know, people are taking very entrenched positions uh, because they think that this is uh, a situation that they're not prepared to accept. Before ECHR, crofting right to buy <coughs> was accepted, but in terms of community right to buy, it looks to me as though there's going to be a challenge, whatever. Now, I was going to ask you at the end when you're going to respond to our stage one <coughs> report, because we need to see that. And in that report, the issue about human rights and equalities was dealt with in the following fashion. The issue of ECHR was set against the UN Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, Article 11. And uh, Malcolm Coombe suggested that when you put the two together, that you actually are talking about matters that lead you not to think just about property, but about sustainable use of land. Because if you're going to fulfil such matters as food, housing, sanitation, etc., you actually have to see that in terms of it being sustainably usable uh, and not being neglected and abandoned or whatever. So they're trying to suggest to you that it would be a good idea to find a way in which you test the ECHR, in my view, against the UN covenant. Because if a court was faced with the situation where someone challenged a decision of ours on the basis that the ECHR was breached, are you prepared to push something which the UK has signed up to uh, since the 1970s in terms of this covenant as something that perhaps actually overrides ECHR? And although the Scotland Act says that we're responsible for ECHR, because there's going to be challenges in court almost certainly, isn't it time that we were going back with something that overrides ECHR in this case? Okay. So, we can, in, in the first instance, of course, we can come back to the committee with with some with a further response to that. But the what we what we have to do in all instances is find a way of articulating clearly the public interest and balancing that public interest against the rights of individuals and, and the rights of communities. And essentially, with any, with, any, with any process like the community right to buy, the Crofton community right to buy, the proposal on neglected land, that's what it's trying to do. So I would probably sort of want the committee to reflect on the fact that these things are prob probably all possible, but it's about making sure that the, that the tests that are set out and the checks and balances in a proposal achieve that outcome in a fair and balanced way. And in the context of what we've put forward so far around neglected land, we think we've struck that balance in the right way, subject to some worth, further thinking around the, 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 the definition of neglected and abandoned land. Now, if, if we were to go, if we were to broaden things out to other areas where, where we want to take action, then we need to think through that in a in a broader context so we, we need to and these these are all things that we're thinking around in the context of the land reform consultation and where else where, where else government might choose to go i just want to give the committee a reassurance that we are considering all of this um right now and we are sort of looking at how we can broaden um, the definition the government has responded um to the committee's um stage one report that has um been sent um yesterday this morning. This, it was sent this morning, so the committee should um, should have that. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm just suggesting that you take very seriously um, the context in which we're working, because uh, for us to be able to achieve something that's lasting, uh, we're going to have to take into account this moving platform on which we work. And uh, I, I think that uh, the land reform document talked about. Uh, land reform for Scotland for the common good, or a phrase like that. That suggests that the common good is actually overriding mm. that of individual current landholders. Uh, and it seems to me, if that balance is going to be reflected in the amendments that are brought forward for uh, neg neglected and abandoned thing, that you should take that in, on board. 
and we're happy to do so. Good. Any further points? I hope not. Certainly, we've got we've gone round this house. Uh, if we haven't, I, I hope that uh, this has been a constructive way to deal with uh, this approach. I thank you very much for uh, the, the evidence, and I hope that the government, you know, will be able to meet uh, our, our wishes. And indeed, that when we read uh, your report back to us, that uh, some of this will become clearer. So, thank you very much, Minister, and your uh, colleagues for giving us evidence just now. Uh, We'll take a short five-minute suspension because we've got a big group coming in and we need a wee break as well. Thank you.
So I welcome everybody to the committee for agenda item two on the Scottish Government's Wild Fisheries Review. Um, and this will allow us to take evidence from stakeholders this morning. I should point out that on the original uh, agenda, it was stated that Dr. David Summers, Fisheries Director of the Tay District Salmon Fisheries Board, was going to join us, but unfortunately has been unable to do so. Uh, so just so that you understand how we work, uh, we will in a moment go round the table and say who we are. Uh, the sound is controlled centrally, and uh, when you indicate you wish to speak, and I say that you can, then you will be able to make your contribution. It doesn't mean that everybody has to answer every question, given that uh, we all uh, probably can hear uh, the force of uh, the arguments from uh, colleagues uh, as we move forward. So, uh, going round the room so that I can see all the names, if you just introduce yourself, uh, the gentleman here, first of all. Uh, yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Andy Walker, retired fisheries biologist from Pitlochry from the government. Um, for my evil sins, I've been made the vice chairman of the, one of the committees of SANA, Scottish Anglers National Association. SANA is the yes. recognised governing body for angling. Thank you. Game angling. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Sarah Boyack, Labour MSP for Lothian. Craig McIntyre, representing Argyle Fisheries Trust. Thank you. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSP for Skylach Abar and Bainach. Uh, Jamie Ribbons from the Galloway Fisheries Trust. Crispin Cook, representing the Northern District Salmon Fishery Board. Uh, Ron Woods, uh, representing the Scottish Federation for Course Angling. Uh, Jamie McGregor, MSP for Highlands and Islands. And if I may declare an interest, I am also chairman of the Loch Awe Improvement Association, which runs the protection order on Loch Awe and Avic. And, and I also a sit as a member of the Awe District River Improvement Association. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you there. But Jamie's just joining us as a member of parliament, uh, not as a member of the committee. Mike Russell, MSP for Argyll and Butte, and therefore Jamie's MSP. Constituency MSP. <laughs> Um, Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Hugh Campbell Adamson, Chairman of the Salmon Trout Association Scotland. It's a charity campaigning and, uh, for the conservation of salmon, sea trout, and trout. Uh, Jim Hume, Liberal, Liberal Democrat, MSP for South Scotland. And Mick Young from the River Tweed Commission. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. Uh, James Mackay, representing the Salmon Aid Association of Scotland. Good morning, I'm Graham Day, I'm the MSP for Angus South. And as the convener, I'm uh, Rob Gibson, the MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. Uh, so we're going to kick off thinking about the balance between national leadership and local delivery in terms of uh, the way that the Fisheries Review uh, has proposed. So what does the panel think about the proposal to establish a national unit with responsibility for fisheries management? And who should head this up? Um, should the unit be part of government or separate for government? For example, a non-departmental uh, body. So that's my first question. Uh, if anyone would like to indicate uh, an intention to answer, please do. Good. I'm uh, James Mackay. Uh, I would think it should be run by uh, somebody of a very neutral uh, or organisation, probably a government, and possibly made up of a committee by MSPs, a freshwater fisheries a team, probably stakeholders from the Anglian associations and uh, district, different uh, bodies there. Also, the Salmonite Association maybe have some part of the, the consultation team, and, and obviously you'd have to take in a people like your environmental agencies as well. So we're talking about a national unit and trying to make it slim, I think. Uh, that sounds like quite big. Mm -hmm. uh, do, does anyone want to come back on that just now? James Ribbon? Jamie Ribbon? Yep. 
Um, I, th I think the key thing is it's still, it's still to be defined. Um, we, we're still sort of unsure about exactly what this central unit w would be. Um, and that's the sort of key thing. I mean, one of the, one, one of the things that's been suggested about exactly where it is and, and, and set in government, and I don't actually think that's that important at this stage to decide where that is. It's more the sort of role. And what we would be expecting is that it is looking at sort of the national strategy, obviously. It's looking through central resourcing. That, that's one of the, the, the key elements that that would have to look through. Um, the work plans, you know, there's a strong element, and that's something that the trusts have been involved in already, very much through work plans. Um, and we would hope to have guidance and support going down to the FMOs at that level from, from this sort of central unit. OK. Um, Graham Day's just going to put in a little supplementary that might be helpful at the moment. Yeah, good morning, Camino, and, and good morning to the panel. Um, can, I, can I just pose a question? How do the panel view the proposed changes to the structures set against the kind of conflicts that we've seen arise on some of our rivers? Do you think the potential changes could reduce the kind of conflicts we've seen, or is there a potential to make them more prevalent? With this national body in particular? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody want to take that up? Uh, Huey Campbell Adamson? It's, I think perhaps Graham is referring to local conflicts in your area. Um, I don't know whether he is. No, no, so, sorry, I'm, I'm implying. I, I think it's important that the problems we've had in the past, and there certainly has been problems in the past between the different exploiters of our fishing resource, of our salmon resource, that has been a problem without doubt. And I think the idea of having a centralised system may well get round that to degree. The, my only concerns are, in the end, you mustn't lose the local volunteers we have in the area, as we talked about before. I think we'll come on to that as a second yeah. question just now, because it's two-sided. The national... Well, does anyone else get any comments about the national unit, or are we generally agreed to leave it at that just now? Well, if that's the case, um, we we're talking about establishing uh, local fishery management organisations. So does the review establish the right balance between the national accountability and the strategy and local empowerment and delivery? And, uh, you know, how does the powers of the FMOs compare to the powers which district salmon fishery boards currently hold? Ron, you want to say something? Um, well, it, it, in the sense that um, course angling is not uh, under the uh, uh, responsibilities currently held by uh, uh, salmon fishery boards, obviously this brings the, the all-species concept, uh, brings, uh, brings uh, course angling into that field. Um, we're, I think, recognised and have for some years recognised that all species management is the way forward and very much something that we would uh, support. Uh, we have, however, uh, specific concerns that it must not simply be the management of all species, but management for the benefit of all species. Um, we, uh, we, we are concerned that, uh, uh, that the priority uh, well, well, we recognise that, that for various financial and other reasons, salmon must must have a very high uh, influence on the, the management, uh, that the priority should not act to the detriment of coarse fish. Uh, for that reason, we, we, you know, uh, one of our particular concerns is that the constitution or the constitutional arrangements under which um, uh, fisheries management organisations are set up make it very clear that there is uh, a responsibility for the well-being of all species rather than simply control of them. Um, and secondly, that in this interplay between the central unit and the fisheries management organisations, there are checks and balances which ensure that, um, uh, shall we say, any kind of rogue activities can be um, uh, prevented. 
Um, I, I, uh, uh, I think that's much less likely than it was 25, 30 years ago or longer. Um, we've seen a much reduced, thanks to the influence, I think, of the trusts, um, we've seen a much reduced emphasis on um, coarse fish being regarded as vermin and, uh, uh, and cold and so on. Yeah. Um, but there are still instances of it going on, and we need to, uh, our big concern is to nail that down. But the strategy is about local empowerment and delivery, yes. Yes. Uh, and therefore, presumably, that would be something that is welcomed by, uh, uh, yes, uh, Craig McIntyre? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, having the, a local FMO, a fishery management organisation, is absolutely essential to keep local river owners, local angling clubs involved in fisheries management. Certainly, as a, a relatively small fisheries trust, that's where we've had our largest successes, is working with local communities, not even just fisheries interests, but other interests as well. So that's something we would definitely favour. Uh, were you going to say something, Andy Walker? I thought you were. I was thinking that I was in agreement with everything I'm hearing. Fine. Sana okay. certainly agrees with it all. Okay. Uh, any other comments just now on that? Yes, Jamie McGregor. Just, just a, a small comment. Um, that in terms of protection orders, of course, protection well, orders... Well, we come into protection orders I know, but I'm on. just saying, from, from the local management point of view, only cover non-migratory species and not migratory species. So there's always been a slight um, difficulty when it comes to managing, um, because, what, you know, it's not... You're looking at one thing and not the whole picture. Good. Well, OK, thank you for that. Um, we'll move on to resourcing wild fisheries management, and uh, Jim Hume is going to kick off, Mike Russell going to follow... Yes, yeah. Yeah, thank, th thanks very much, uh, Convener. There's, there's two or three lines of questioning on this. We've got some good input from the Galloway Fisheries Trust um, in the document that came to us just a, a day or uh, two, two ago. Obviously, the, uh, the review proposal to replace the current system of levying contributions uh, from owners of salmon fishings, fishings with a national levy, and we heard from Andrew Thin that... Uh, if thought by, by ministers or, or the central body that money from one area could be spent better in, a, in another area, then that would happen. I was just wondering what the panel's view is on, on the change in the levying system and, and the thought that funds could go from one area, which is maybe uh, doing better than other areas, and, and uh, the funds therefore going to different parts of the country. Yes, Jamie Ribbon. Thanks. As, as mentioned there, we did put in a submission. Um, the, the sort of model that we worked within Ga Galloway Fishery Trust has been very much to multiply up the, this locally collected levy, um, uh, and that's a similar model along a lot of the West Coast. We would very much support this central collection of a levy that can then be redistributed, because the present system, if you don't have this multiplier effect, very much focuses more money to where the fisheries are the most healthiest. Um, and, and, and in a way, a way. So, so you will get the best accountability, your, your best bang for buck as such back if, if you have that ability to be able to move it around. Mm -hmm. Alec Ferguson. Now, just a, a quick follow-up on that, if I may, just because um, I, I obviously know that um, your, your own financial structure and, and, and it relies a great deal on local fundraising uh, uh, as well as your own efforts in terms of attracting grants and, and all that sort of thing. Do, do you feel that there is a danger, or does anybody else feel there is a danger of a national levy going to a sort of basically a central distribution point, if I can put it like that, could have an impact on the local fundraising capabilities that I suspect most trusts rely on to one degree or another? Um. Not necessarily. The, the main thing really is, is about the FMOs. If you can have an FMO that's set up that still has this local accountability, has this local link, that, that's a key thing to get the local support. Um, I, th I think if the, if the payments made from the fisheries into a central organisation, which is then, as it were, bid for to see how Scotland can benefit the most from that, that money collected, uh, I don't see that having, losing local um, support. You know, I think more if FMOs are not fit for purpose, are not uh, able to be engaged at the local level, that, that would be the, 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 the biggest concern. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Graeme Day. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just in reflecting upon this, because it's a levy on uh, rod and net that's been talked about, um, would it not be appropriate that if 
for example, the netting was taking place in a mixed stock fishery. The, the, if you like, the compensatory element of this and the money going elsewhere should be reflected in that and an impact on the rivers or be directed to the rivers that are being impacted upon by the fishing in a mixed stock rather than transfer, say, from the east of Scotland to the west of Scotland. But yeah. Some people haven't yeah. said so, anything yet. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would support that. I, I think it's more as a principle what's been, what's been talked about is, is this ability, which would be quite different to, to how it is at the moment, is this ability to look at where, where impacts. And yes, it, it, it's not automatic east and west. Um, it, it's, yes. it's looking at where the, where the maximum benefit is. You may say that some of the west there, the coast, some of the areas on the west coast are so hard hit that the level of money that might be required to trigger it um, would, would not suggest um, that would be the best thing. So what we're more looking at is, is the principle um, that, that, that the money can be transferred around to, to where it would have its great, greatest benefit. James Mackay and then uh, Nick Young. Um, regarding mix of fisheries and uh, the levy, uh, I can't actually see uh, where or how you could uh, diversify the figure and how you could make the split. I think if we're a, in a new organization, I think the netting and the, the angling fraternity would have to go into it equally. And I think the mixed stock fishing uh, is another issue that we talked about at another stage. Uh, it, it is a, quite a complex issue. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the financing of it, I think, it doesn't reflect on the rivers that were supposedly uh, affecting. Uh, I know it's SEC rivers that is supposed to be getting uh, the damage done to them and, and impact by mixed stock fisheries. And uh, my fishery is a brandy as a mixed stock fishery as well. So uh, I would, uh, and uh, well, Big stock, I know, as, as another subject, probably will be discussed here, so I, I, I'll not go on about that because. Uh, sure, but certainly will. Uh, Nick Young. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I, I think there is a the, there is a potential problem with the reallocation of funds. Uh, the the funding situation of wild fisheries, fisheries management in Scotland is is pretty diverse and quite different, uh, in di both in different parts of the country, different rivers between rivers, some are relatively well funded, some are very, very badly funded, some have almost no money at all. Um, so on the face of it, there might be a case for collecting it centrally and redistributing it, but I think if you did that, you'd then have to decide, well, what did you not want to have done on those rivers that were already being adequately or more or less adequately funded? Um, and I don't think it gets away from the fact that actually there's not enough money generally for, to sort the whole problem out, and there is a problem. Um, and the real root of the problem is that there isn't enough money uh, being spent on wild fisheries management. Well, I think we'll explore that a bit further. Uh, come back to Jim. Yeah, Hume, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll sort of try and round this part off. I mean, part of the Galloway Fisheries Trust, I just wonder if this affects others, is uh, because they're a trust, they're a charity, and therefore they're able to uh, access funds from uh, places that charities can access funds. I wonder if that would affect others if the MF, uh, sorry, if the FMOs are not charities. Therefore, obviously, it looks like they're, um, they should, yep. be, should be charities. And just back to the, the, the levying part, just to be clear, uh, uh, do any of the, the, the guests here today think that there could be challenges from some of the fishery uh, owners uh, regarding their levies being uh, redirected? Yep. Any comments about that? especially people who haven't spoken already. No. Hugh Campbell-Adamson. It's a good point. People will be uncomfortable thinking that what they're traditionally the past have paid the levies have gone from an individual river. Your point, Mr Hume, is very good. But it doesn't alter the fact that the present system um, does, if you have a successful river which has got plenty of salmon in it, it creates, it can raise more money. And the reverse of that, of course, if you have a river which is struggling, for other reasons, whether it's aquaculture or just basically change in climate, um, we'll have less money coming in. So the idea of some sort of fertilisation by the richer for the poorer does make sense. Okay. Uh, Ron Woods. Um, 
I, I don't know if you would feel it a diversion, but I, in relation to this recommendation, I'd like to comment on the issues surrounding the extension of levy mechanisms to other species. Would you rather wait till that comes up in a different context? Well, bear it in mind, and you'll get Thank to you. raise it, yes. Uh, to, to sticking with the, the levy situation just now, Mike Russell. Yes, uh, the principal, uh, in terms of investment that we just heard re um, uh, referred to, the principal proposal within the report is uh, the possibility of the government at some stage introducing a rod licence and those monies going to investment because, as Andrew Thrin has rightly pointed out, the public purse is unlikely to meet those costs, uh, certainly in the foreseeable future. But Andrew's indicated in evidence last week that that would have to be tied to an expansion of fishing through what he called an angling for all scheme. And he pointed out that in his view and in the view of his committee, uh, Scotland is underfished and that of course the uh, preponderance of those who take part are male and of a certain age, a bit like politics really. Um, in those circumstances, I want to know people's views on the rod license, the angling for all scheme and how it might operate. Because I, I think all of us have constituents have expressed some considerable concern about rod licences. Do you want to come back in just now, Ron? I, I can, if you wish. Yes, that's yeah. uh, certainly an issue that um, is of considerable interest and importance to us. Uh, I, I would start from the premise, I think the rod licence is not only desirable, but it's the only effective way of raising a significant amount of money for fish, fisheries right. management for other species. I, I, there, are, there are all sorts of reasons why the current mechanism, levy mechanism for salmon fisheries may or may not work, but it's feasible. Uh, a levy mechanism for freshwater fisheries is uh, unlikely to yield any significant amount of money and would create a vast amount of bureaucracy. Um, I think as well we need to look at the example of other countries and with with, with the exception, I think, of Ireland, virtually every uh, uh, civilised country in the Northern Hemisphere has some sort of national licence, rod licence, state licence, call it what you will. And it appears to be they, 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 they confer different benefits and they charge different rates, but it appears to be f philosophically acceptable to anglers in most of these places. Um, it seems to me that we would, need, we would not need necessarily to follow precisely the English model to have a rod licence either. Um, the, the, the differentiation of rates for migratory fishing and other species may or may not be necessary, but I, I don't think it's a, a, an essential component of the concept. Um, tying it completely to an angling for all programme gives us concern at this stage. I'm not saying in the longer term that that might not be where the lion's share of the money raised would go. But in our view, there are there are some very fundamental issues that need to be addressed in relation to protection of coarse fish stocks and money raised from road licences or whatever other source of funding is used um, first needs to tackle that. We need much more robust bailiffing arrangements um, which need to be underpinned by changes to statute but we no doubt come to that. Um, and we need a lot more scientific information before we have any idea what is a sustainable level of exploitation. Uh, sustainability for coarse fish is different uh, in as far as by and large um, it should be uh, a catch and release activity but sadly we've, we've had a sizable increase in pot hunting in recent years and we simply don't know what the stocks are like or how robust they are in the great majority of waters. There are one or two places, Loch Awe is a notable example, where there's been good scientific work which gives you a reasonable indication of, of stock levels and dynamics but that is by far the exception rather than the rule and until we know what's sustainable and what levels of stock we have. Um, we have some reservations about uh, saying that Scot Scotland's waters are underfished for coarse fish. Nothing more we would like than to see more development of the sco sport, bringing in young people, bringing in more revenue from tourists. But uh, frankly, until we know that the, the, the resource is, is capable of sustaining that, then I would not want our rod licences, which as I say we, we think is a, 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 a good thing, to be spent on doing that. Just to answer your question, a couple more people. Crispian Cook, you know, as the clerk of a, a salmon fishery board, you know, what's your attitude towards rod licences, levies and so on? I read the, um, the transcript of last week's meeting with some, with some interest. I think the um, 
the notion that a, a rod license could be used for a very discrete purpose, um, one that um, was able to encourage um, uh, perhaps the, the development of fisheries, uh, acknowledging that there are um, perhaps some limitations in the, you know, our knowledge of the, the fisheries that we have and their, uh, and their capacity for, uh, for additional use. Nevertheless, I think the, that looked at from a salmon angler's point of view, uh, I think that if you are um, raising a rod license for a very particular purpose, which is generally positive for ultimately for the benefit of an angler um, who will want, who enjoys his sport, serious about his sport and will want to see it uh, encouraged and developed perhaps for the next generation, um, as um, we alluded to with the increasing age in, uh, in anglers, then I don't see anything other than the potential for it to be positive. Um, if it was to be used purely as an additional um, funding resource without purpose, I think that would be more difficult to, um, to sell, if that's the right word. <laughs> Yeah, we're not talking about tax, we're talking about something to, for reinvestment, obviously. No, no, of course. Um, and uh, uh, Nick Young? Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Rod licenses are highly contentious, uh, and um, uh, people are very divided on their views on it. Um, on the Tweed, we, we certainly don't have a need for one and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't welcome one. My angling clubs on the Tweed tell me that they would um, be very opposed to it because they think it would... Um, uh, stop people going fishing. It wouldn't encourage them. It would be something that would discourage them from going. Um, we're, f we're fortunate, perhaps, in that we uh, have a, uh, a large enough run of salmon that we can collect our funds without having to um, having to resort to uh, something like that. But um, I, I think that's the worry of the angling clubs, that um, there's a lot of retired people who um, would find it perhaps too much to buy both a rod license and their existing club permit. Um, and that uh, it would discourage young people from doing it if they, they thought they had to pay. Because at the moment, it's a relatively, um, uh, it's an extremely cheap occupation. It's um, okay. 20, 30 pounds for a season ticket to fish on the Tweed. So it's, um, uh, uh, and there's a, so you could argue perhaps there's a potential for increasing that, but at the same token, I think a lot of people think it would um, uh, put people off. Uh, for, for, for salmon fishing, um, uh, I, that hasn't really been discussed, but um, you, you could argue that salmon fishing is relatively more expensive, so it would perhaps be a small increment on what people are already paying. Whether, whether the collection of it would be efficient in terms of the amount of money you could raise, I, I don't know. That would have to be looked at. So, Mike Russell? Yeah. I think, therefore, there's a mixed response to it. In terms of investment, then, if ang angling for all is not the priority, what are the priorities for investment? I mean, Nick has referred twice to the need for investment. What are the priorities for investment? And hypothetically, how could they and will they be met if there is no rod license? Uh, yes, Nick. Yeah, well, well, there are already... I mean, the, the angling for all is a perfectly laudable um, uh, uh, um, uh, process, and I'm, I'm not in any way saying we don't need it. Um, it is true, certainly for uh, other freshwater f fishes... Um, that there is a certain age profile and uh, we need to get more young people interested in fishing. I don't think anyone disputes that. And there are a number of initiatives uh, going on throughout the whole country, actually. Um, and one thing we could do is perhaps draw those together and let them feed on each other to especially encourage young people to start fishing because they're, they're what create the, um, the interest in fish and the interest in fisheries management. And we have, we have got a paucity of young people coming forward. There's no question about that. We're all aware of that. So we definitely need to promote that. Um, uh, how it's funded, of course, is another matter. Um, but, but its requirement is quite definitely there. Yes, uh, Craig McIntyre. Thank you. Um, in our guile, when we talk to the angling clubs, there is a, a definite problem with uh, a lack of young people coming through, and that's recognised... And with the Fisheries Trust, we've been tinkering with doing, um, introducing f angling, fishing into schools. We've done it in, uh, in Glenda Rural School, Mr Russell's local school. And it's been highly successful where we've been able to find funding for it. And it's, it's not very expensive. And 
if we could, if we were able to fund a national programme, and the kids, the kids love it. The kids love going fishing, getting out, the, getting out the classroom. So if we were able to do something, and if it's if the only way to fund it was through a road licence, then I would be all in favour of it. I think it would be a fantastic thing. Well, I have to add to this uh, whole male panel. You know, we didn't just say about participation by young people, but by women. And uh, you know, I wonder if there's some psychological thing about uh, the way in which women view angling that uh, it's never going to attract them in the way that it attracts men. Can I just briefly for the record say that uh, if my colleague Claudia Beamish were here, she would disagree with you. She is actually quite keen on angling. And I think it's, uh, I wonder if the point about school is quite a, an important thing about getting access to it at an early age without thinking about whether it's for men or women. So maybe that's... Um, Partly about education, partly about attitudes. So, Ron? Uh, just to... Uh, one, of, one of the things which I think was slightly unfortunate, and I don't think Andrew Thin quite um, picked up on in, uh, in some of the meetings we had with him, there is already some very good work being done. It's being done under the auspices of a joint angling development board for Scotland, um, which involves ourselves... Uh, SANA and the Scottish Federation for Sea Angling. Um, we have developed, uh, I know it's not my side of the business, so forgive me if I get this wrong, but certainly up to level three qualifications that can be taken in schools. We are working with schools to set up coaching sessions. We have a proper licensed coaching scheme because obviously there are all sorts of child protection and other issues that uh, uh, that can arise with uh, with a, a piecemeal approach um, and we have very welcome support both from Sports Scotland and uh, from uh, the Scottish Government through Marine Scotland um, so this is not starting from a blank canvas there is already some coordinated activity um, and as a matter of interest uh, one of the leading lights in the uh, coaching programmes going out doing outreach for um, uh, the, the schools young people and vulnerable adu adults is actually a lady called Heather Lauriston who fishes internationally both in course angling and sea angling for Scotland and uh, is very much a role model and is working hard to try and bring girls into the sport as well. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we need to have something to catch and uh, for the subject of sustainable harvesting. Oh, Alec Ferguson. We'd ask for a supplementary on the rod licensing. Certainly. Thank you. I'm sorry, convener. I thought I had caught you right. Um, no, I just wanted to, I think it was uh, Mr Woods who recommended, who mentioned tourists really, people who come to Scotland to fish. And I just wanted to touch on the possible impact of rod licensing on that sector because I am amazed by the number of people from my constituency who have in the, in the deep southwest of Scotland that have contacted me on this. Um, and I, I, whatever way you look at this, the, the impact of the various recommendations of this, if they're all put into place, are going to have uh, an add-on cost for fishing for people who want to fish. Um, I'm quite sure that the big, the well-known rivers, the Tweeds and the Tays, will still continue to attract people in the same numbers they do. But what's been put to me is that on some of the smaller rivers, such as exist in, in my constituents in the southwest, um, these measures could have a very serious impact on people who come to fish, stay, the local bed and breakfast, all the things that help the, 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 the rural economy. Uh, and I just wondered if, if that's a genuine concern. Uh, what, I just want, I'm totally neutral on this particular issue, but I just wonder if I could just, if anybody has any thoughts on it, whether they could expand Certainly on it. Certainly be helpful if we had an international perspective on this as well, because our tourists put off for going to other places. Uh, you know, strikes me as well would be some sort of balance in the debate. Yeah, Jamie Ribbon. This isn't an international answer. Eh? I mean, this is to do to South West Scotland. I mean, that, that's been raised with us a lot, and, and I think it's a genuine concern, because fishing is relatively cheap. Um, you know, some angling clubs are, are under £100 a year. To, you can buy a day ticket for £10. So, so the sort of add-on um, is quite high, potentially, with, with the rod licence in those areas compared to some areas, uh, to some other areas. Um, and also from South West, there's always been a sort of competitive advantage trying to sell fishing um, compared to, to the Lake District, where there's a requirement for, for a rod licence. Um, the trouble is, it just keep going back to this finance issue. You know, the levy, if it was at 45p as suggested before, would, wouldn't even raise £2 million 
I believe, on the sort of set rate of values at the moment. Um, so so it, it is this, this difficult about exactly if finance. We've raised it with you, uh, with other members a number of times. Fi finance of, of the new structure is, is going to be so key to this. This is trying to get this, this balance between um, where the money can come from um, and it, doesn't, it isn't counterproductive because the whole thing gets undermined if you suddenly lose ang anglers. Um, uh, you know, there was a previous question talking about children and talking about trying to get w women, women into, into fishing. Th those are areas that I think most trusts are very, very keen on trying to push. The, there's lots of little projects. I think people are finding it difficult. We, we can take out kids fishing. They love it. The scheme runs very, very well. But there doesn't seem to be a, a huge take-up afterwards. Uh, it seems to be that maybe children nowadays with a lot of sports get involved, do it, tick the box and move on. It's how to try and to try and step that, 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 that next step to try and keep them in it. Uh, w women to fishing. Sorry, convenience sort of going back to the previous question. That, that's something we have been trying to look into. Uh, and we think that one of the key things, which I think Andrew Thin brought up again, was all about information. Um, what, one of the key things, that the, the feedback we're getting, is that women want toilets and, and some of these other issues available at the fishing. That isn't something that's often highlighted uh, when people are talking about different fishing and sort of extra resources and stuff like that. And I think there is a big thing, if we wanted to market fishing, is better um, information about, the, about fishing. Absolutely key to, to it. Andy Walker. SANA has a very declared position against rod licences. Um, actually, I think it's founded on a fairly flimsy amount of assessment of, of the membership. But that is the view that's portrayed all the time. I, actually, I am firmly in favour of rod licences. And I'm, I'm a vice chairman of a committee. But there you go. Um, we, we are trying hard to encourage ladies and, and women into, into the sport and ch children into the sport, as, as Ron says. We're linked together in this. Um, lo locally in, in the Pitlochry area, we tr we've given free membership to juniors for many years now, and it's having very little effect. There's been a big change in, in what youngsters want to do. In the past, we would go out and fish burns and things, and all that's all gone, as far as I can see. Uh, largely, a lot of the burns have been denatured by what we've done to them as well, and need to be improved, and money needs to be spent there. But there's been a di big demographic change in the way that, um, this, that the anglers deal with fish now. Uh, there's the wild fisheries that, that this review is supposed to be about, but actually probably more trout anglers now fish for stocked rainbow trout than they do for wild fish. These are fish that are, are obvi obviously they're uh, sustainable because they're sustained by fish farms. All they need is the water to put the fish into, basically. The toilets can be provided, the information can go out so the ladies can see that they're going to be okay there. And, and the youngsters have then got to pay the money that's required for catching these fish. Now that's the sticking point. Youngsters have not got the money to spend on these fisheries where it costs a lot to take the, the fish, even on a catch and release basis. So there's a lot of different aspects here which have to be taken into account. I think we're speaking from the same hymn book overall. I think we, yes, indeed, Huey Campbell Adamson here. About the attitude from foreigners, as you put it, so people coming to fish in Scotland from out with. But people go to other countries to fish in the same way. Well, what I'm saying with that is the point of that is that those people who go abroad all buy their licences. And I'm asked quite often, where do I buy a licence to fish in Scotland? Because they are used to fishing, used to licences. And as backing up what you said, the other advantage of licences, and I'm not really keen personally one way or the other, I'm not got a real view on it, it does give buy-in. It gives the people who buy a licence a feeling part of that system. And that's actually quite important because instead of just going there fishing and disappearing, but it's been like being a member of a club. You tend to take much more interest in the running of the club. OK, with Ron Woods, I think Sorry. we just get the fact... Briefly, to, to, to say, I, I, I'm one of these guys that goes abroad to fish, uh, and the thing that attracts me to go someplace is the quality of the fishing. Um, if I have to pay a local licence, I accept that. If my fishing permit there costs me a bit more, it's certainly costing me less than the journey to go there. Um, uh, people are buying the overall experience and they don't mind that. If I, if I can possibly quote an example from Mr Ferguson's own constituency area, um, we used to have an awful lot of tourist anglers coming to fish Loch Cain. Uh, there is no money 
to control the crayfish in Loch Ken, and the fishery has declined and the uh, tourist anglers have declined. I don't think there'd be many of those tourist anglers or any of the, the regulars like myself who fish it who would quibble about paying a bit towards management if that money was going to control the crayfish and make it a better fishery again. Sarah Boyack, then Jim Hume. It was a question um, to follow up about the information for people, either locally or from other parts of the UK or people coming from abroad, um, to what extent uh, well-maintained websites would actually help so that you would know in advance or you could be encouraged to go to certain areas and to what extent the new system suggests would help that or to what extent local organisations are already, already doing that. So if you're going abroad, you're not just going to go abroad and then bowl along to somewhere. You'll check it out in advance. So it was just to what extent we are actually doing that properly or whether it could be improved. I think we probably can. But certainly people... It was to get witnesses' views on it. Nodding kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. What do the wit witnesses Yeah. Uh, well, uh, our local uh, angling body in Pitlochry has its own website and deals with s selling the permits through the website, giving the information to everybody about where the fishing is available and where to go and what the rules are. And we've gradually got other members of the area to come into our website. They're moving in now. Loch Tumble, Loch Ranach are moving in to join this in the same service. Now, this has been done through the local protection order, which, of course, we're moving into a different area here of discussion. But it's, it's proving to be a major success. Now, whether that should be a model for other areas or they should all have their own ones that are slightly different, I don't know. But it's certainly a, a big step forward in providing information. That's good. That's helpful. Jim Hume. Yeah, very much. Uh, we've obviously had different views on, on, on road licensing, which, uh, uh, which isn't surprising, a, a barrier uh, to some, and happy to pay a bit, uh, to, to quote Ron Woods. I just wonder from just two or three maybe guests here what they would say was a, a reasonable amount for a licence. Uh, so it's, n it's not a barrier to youngsters, but uh, Ron Woods is quite happy to, to pay per, per year or per month or per week or per day. Well, not to have an auction for bidding for the lowest <laughs> level <laughs> levy. But it's a reasonable question because, you know, yeah. nobody's going to blink at a pound, but they maybe would blink at £100 a day, you know, for extreme examples. True, but then you might compare it to going to a football match or playing a round of golf or whatever. Yeah, uh, you know, so, so I don't know whether it's a fair question. Anyone want Probably to respond at all? Question. <laughs> Ron Wood. It's, it seems to me that um, it would be perfectly possible to structure it so that young people either had it free or for a very nominal cost. Um, personally, um, I, I fish a bit in England and reasonably happily shell out £25 or thereabouts a year for my road licence for there. Uh, I wouldn't... I wouldn't blink an eye about having to do the same in Scotland. Um, I might blink an eye if it was a three-figure sum, um, but uh, everybody will have their own attitude. But I think it's important that you can have a structured system so that, for instance, visiting anglers can buy one for a week for a comparatively small amount, and particularly so that juniors or um, uh, I strike, uh, I hesitate to say pensioners, but uh, uh, because it might be self-interest, but uh, juniors or pensioners or the disabled might be able to get uh, uh, get reduced f uh, fees. But um, uh, I, I think that that's all in the detail rather than the principle. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Jim. Um, I think we want to move on to sustainable harvest, since this is quite a key part of uh, what we've got. Alec Ferguson's going to kick off. I just might, before I do so, I might just comment that if we're going to use the road licence to get rid of crayfish in Loch Ken, I think we're looking at more than 25 quid a head, but it, um, that's just a, a mere aside. It is a huge problem. Um, yes, thank you, Convener. If we could move on to this whole subject of sustainability, because that really is what is at the heart of this entire um, strategy, really. Um, and in just in trying to get... I've been trying to sort of identify the evidence that suggests that rod-caught salmon are a threat to the sustainability of particularly salmon stock, um, and that rod, uh, killing rod-caught salmon actually has a negative impact on the sustainability of the species. And twice last week I asked Andrew Thin um, about that evidence, and, and in essence his answer was, well, it is a fact that most years rods kill more fish than nets do, um, given, given the number of nets that uh, have spectacularly declined over the years and, and having been bought off, I, I think that probably wouldn't 
be a huge surprise, but do, do people recognise that? Do, do, do rods yeah. kill more salmon than nets? Yes, I can imagine that there uh, will be a few answers to this. So, Huey Campbell Adamson first. Is it just a quick on a matter of fact, and I have spoken to Andrew Thin on this. In the last five years, the number of fish caught uh, killed by anglers has been less than in the number of nets. That's not, an, I'll immediately say no, that's not an, a comment against nets. It's a comment against the fact that nets can have a huge influence in certain areas. But that's a different question. But certainly, uh, Mr. Thin has accepted that his, his information was erroneous to say there's more fish killed by anglers. Well, let's be quite clear about this. He said, in most years. He didn't talk about the last five years. He talked about in most years. And, uh, you know, a significant number of fish are killed on rivers by rods. Mm. Um, but, quoting but, but, exactly. What, what, what I was looking for, uh, and what I was trying to get last week, is, can, I mean, can anybody point me towards... This? We, we are told that this whole strategy must depend on the best scientific evidence available, and I have no argument with that whatsoever. Can anybody point me towards the evidence that shows that angling has a detrimental impact on the sustainability of salmon stocks? OK, so... Uh, First of all, James Mackay and then Nick Young. Yeah. I was going to say that you can see, I mean, the Marine Scotland is sticking the figures every year and going back over your, your, your reports, every year, as we're saying, the anglers are killing, like 2012, for instance, the anglers killed 22,500 fish. I think the netting killed probably just about half of that. Uh, and to go further on that, uh, you, your anglers, I mean, you're talking, it used to be 18% we talked about for mortality for catch and release. Okay, it's now the goalposts have changed and it's coming down now and we're hearing it's about a 10%, 8 to 10% mortality for catch and release fish. Now, if there's 100,000 fish killed, uh, caught by anglers and released, we still, you can still add, anybody can do the sum, 10 percent, can add 10,000 fish that's killed or dies due to cuts and release. So in the year of that year, 2012, you could go to say that the 22,000 actually went to 34,000 fish that died that year. Furthermore, you can go on to angling into the latter part of the season, our rivers in the north don't. They stop on the 30th of September. But there's some rivers in Scotland and they're fishing into November. Now, to me, eh, anybody could know that a heavily pregnant hen was getting pulled in over their gravel beds in November. It's going to pre-induce spawn. So how many thousand eh, fish has been caused mortality through angling in that case? Can uh, Huey tell me that one, please? Could uh, you? Well, since you've been addressed directly in this case, please do, and then let go. Right. Um, there's various points. I don't know how you're going to handle a convener, but I have the figures here from Marine Scotland. OK. And I can certainly read them out. And just taking your case, uh, James, about, I think you mentioned 2002. 2012. Well, 2012. Well, the nets killed that year, as you said quite rightly, 16,230 and angling, the rods killed that year 22,000, which is greater. But then you take the following year, and this is where we've got to be careful with statistics because everything changes. Yep. But at the end of it all, in, the, in 2013, nets killed 24,370, and rods killed 13,532. So let's not... I don't, think we, I don't want to get sidetracked onto who is killing more. I think all I want to say is I think it will come on to is the fact we're killing too many fish, and that's something we can talk about <laughs> later. But to take on the question I was rather asked to, uh, well, you brought up, is there any proof that angling makes a difference to catch a two stocks? And I, maybe what, um, what Nick was going to come on to, but if you take proportions, and it's a very dangerous thing, and it's very inact, but if you, if you, inexact, but if you do say that one in ten fish going up a river is caught by an angler, <coughs> of which 70% are returned, that means less than 3% of any fish, that, oh, of, the, of the number of fish going up a river, is a very small proportion are actually killed on that proportion. And, and I still don't think it's right. I mean, personally, I'd say that's three, even that 3% is too high in some rivers. But the point is that you've got to take back to the fact we're killing too many fish overall, whether it's anglers or nets. And I don't want to differentiate between the two. OK, so Mike Russell to expand on the point, and then we'll bring in Nick. I think this is really important, because if catch and release is producing mortality, and I think 
uh, except it does produce mortality, we need to know what level of mortality exists in that. It's vital if we're going to understand the figures. I mean, Mr. Mackay has presented you know, a, 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 an argument that the figures in, would indicate that the difference between the two uh, methods are, are, are producing roughly the same result. I entirely agree we have to reduce that result, but the question is if both methods have to be reduced, we need to understand precisely what the numbers are. Now, you know, the mortality in the catch and release, Huey Campbell Abinson is saying, what, 3%? May I come in? Um, excuse me. I think the figures I think I may have sent you, which was from something from the Mixed Stock Working Group, which is a government uh, funded organisation, or um, talk with James and I were both on. And, and that there, the paper was submitted there, which came out about 3%. And I think there's quite good evidence on that. I, I'd rather actually bow down to Mr. Young to explain that better than I am. He's much cleverer on this. Mr. Mackay has indicated 8%. That's a big difference. So where are these figures coming from? The original. Right. 18% is what was the, the, the known fact that everybody was using, kind of. Okay. But uh, as I noticed uh, lately, it is now changed by somebody to around about 8 to 10%. Okay, right. Nick Gell. Thank you, Kavina. Um, can I go back to first principles on, on this? Because I think it's important to understand that it's not actually the actual number of fish that are killed that's important. It's the number in relation to the size of the stock. Yeah. Yeah. And salmon aren't all one stock. On my river, the Tweed, we've got at least six, maybe seven different stocks of fish. And they have different conservation statuses. And the important thing is to apply the right level of management to each of those stocks. So we know, for example, that the early running fish, the spring fish, are very vulnerable. And we've now quite rightly got um, uh, uh, some legislation to protect them. And we've got our own voluntary legislation, as have most other rivers. But the absolute number of fish is only relevant compared to the total run amount of the run. Uh, and that is variable um, both between rivers and within rivers. So until we understand that, the actual number of fish that's killed is not relevant. Now, on my river, the Tweed, um, I think uh, angling, you have, first of all, have to start from angling as an incredibly inefficient way of catching fish. Um, and we think that um, the... Uh, the percentage caught by angling is quite variable. Um, probably the best information on this comes from the Welsh Dee and the very early running fish, the spring fish, which are rare uh, and we know shouldn't be killed. Anglers can probably catch 40% of those. But if you go to the uh, very late running fish on the Tweed, um, the catch of those can be, well, it's certainly less than 10%. It might be, um, uh, it might be as little as 5% uh, on average. And in some years, when there's a really big run, like there was in 2010, the, uh, the actual percentage catch is probably less than 1%. So the kill rate is clearly very important if you're killing a large proportion. But if you're killing a small proportion, it doesn't really matter whether it's 5 or 10%, but you need to know the size of the run. And I think we should stop talking about actually absolute numbers of salmon because they're not all the same. No, okay, right, Mike Russell. There is a very strong purpose in talking about absolute numbers, which is, you know, inevitably the outcome at the end of this discussion will be pain for people because they will reduce the number of fish that they are catching. Right? That, I mean, it's inevitability. I think nobody is in any doubt about that. So we need to understand numbers, and we need to set two different types of things against each other. One of which is sporting activity, and the other one is a long-standing traditional. Uh, method of catching fish, which is a commercial method. I'm not taking sides in this, but it is absolutely important we understand numbers because there will be a reduction uh, for both sides of that equation, and we need to say that against each other. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be deflected from talking about numbers. Uh, I'm quite happy to think about sophistication in those numbers, but it is vital we talk numbers. Can I, yes. can I just agree with Mr. Russell entirely on that? I don't think we should be deflected from numbers. And all that he says is absolutely right. The only thing I was saying was you need to know the size of the total run for each stock of fish before you can determine what's a safe level to kill. Uh, James McKay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll go back to the, the, the balance between net killed and a rubber killed. Net killed, as we're very much reminded, uh, we're, we're, we're killing uh, mixed stock fishes in the, in, the, in the ocean. 
And uh, in, in recent years, uh, we had been in Scotland doing scientific work with me, and, and it, it, the results was great, and it showed that uh, our spread of what we were carrying was over a m massive area between the East Coast and the West Coast of Scotland, and, and it, there was only a small number of fish. But anyway, we'll go back to killing on the rivers. Killing on the rivers is fish that is in the system, a ready to spawn, unless we want to call them mixed stock as well, which they're coming in and out of the river. But we'll say that they're in the river and they're, they're part of that river's a component for, for, for spawning. So the 16,000 or the 22,000 or the 34,000 fish that's killed within a river system or systems in Scotland is a greater impact than the, the 16 or the whatever thousand fish is killed on the coast because that fish that's on the coast is, isn't a, a part of the component of the rivers that we're talking about. Now, you're talking about uh, the, uh, the spring run. And now, your spring run, conservation now, is, which has gone through and, and we have to adhere to it, and we have given 16, 15 or 16 years which is a different subject, but we have given that over the years for uh, conservation reasons. Now, with angling today, they're not allowed to kill a fish until the 1st of April. So that fish is going to go into the river system, and it's going to be in there. It is a spring fish, spring run fish. So what happens is that spring run fish in June or July is still in the river system, and it's going to be caught and possibly killed. So I would, I would go to what all the thing was, uh, and I would suggest that possibly, if you want conservation, there's a 100% catch and release on, on, your, on your river systems. Possibly you might have to open a wee window, a small window within the season that you, some of your anglers or angling clubs might need to get Saturday morning these fish for the pond. I don't know how, uh, how the ministers or, or anybody could work that one out or not, but we feel that the, rivers are, the damage has been done within the river systems more than the sea, and this gentleman here uh, has just indicated that there's six or seven different uh, fish, uh, species of fish or, or mixed stock within the tweed system, now, we're, this is just getting us back to, again, mixed stock fisheries. Uh, we're we're, we're straight back to the thing again that mixed stock is not only on the coast. Mixed stock is within, within your river systems as well. So if you're killing them within the river systems, you're also killing mixed stock. Um, Graham Day. Yeah, but, but let's look at this in a slightly different way. Let's assume that the salmon are a national asset, right? So... So they are. I, I was looking back at figures that we looked at as a committee in December when we were looking at the secondary legislation on the close times. If you take the South Esk, for example, in 2013, 7,159 fish were acknowledged as being caught by the netsmen. I'm not having a go at netting, they just state these figures. 522 were caught by rod, of which 77% were released. Now, as a quick calculation, that means that even if 18% of the released fish died, we're still talking about 600 fish being killed by rod, set against 7,000 plus by nets. Less than six. Come on, what was uh, uh, I actually uh, just seen the, the, the count figures yesterday for, for your asks, or one of the asks, and uh, it, it was quite uh, incredible to see the figures that went over the, the counters of the ask. Uh, uh, right through the whole of the summer. Maybe April is probably the, the least of my memory. So I think it's not the issue. The, uh, the South Ask by all reports is a lack of participation in fishing, I think, to produce figures. So if you haven't got the effort, you're not going to have the fish. So I think maybe you have a catch-22 there, I don't know, but uh, at the end of the day, I think a lot of the issues is, is within the the catchment, the catching powers. Well, let's see if we can now try and tie this up just now. So, Huey Campbell-Adamson, first of all, before we move on. Thank you. 
Just a couple of things, if I could just update what, um, what um, Mr. Day was mentioning the figures. Last year's figures are about 5,200 caught in the nets off the South Esk. And in the river themselves, 50 fish were killed, 500 were caught, and 50 were killed. So if you're taking even 10% of those, it's, it's a very small number that is doing. But that's, that's, that's in part. The other part you mentioned, quite rightly, James, about the counter. The counter has been, f for as our five-year average, has been running at 14,000. Until the last three years, it's now down to 9,000, which showing that there's a problem. And I think there is a problem, and that may be something we're coming on to convener afterwards, but there is a problem. But please don't get it. I'm not attacking netsmen. I'm not attacking netting. I'm ex attacking all exploitation. In a perfect world, in a perfect world, I would agree with you totally, we should have no killing of any fish. One point. One point. Uh, it's been known, uh, Huey, that you want to see the end of netting. Uh, you want to see the end. It's, it's common knowledge. You actually told somebody on, one of the, on the bus, bank of the ESC that he wanted to see him at a business in the next 15 years. And uh, so whether you like it or not, it, is, it, it can go to a court of law or not. That, that can be said, that you said that to a person. You want rid of netting and the rid of netsmen. So you, you can go under any cover you want. That's fact. Okay. I recognise that we have a huge conflict here, which yes. is something which can only be uh, decided ultimately by a, a wild fisheries review that's turned into law yeah. and uh, one where it looks at sustainability and figures for these uh, as the basis of any calculations about who kills what. But uh, Alec Ferguson started this particular... Well, I, I think I want to apologise for that <laughs> the last half an hour, but uh, having said that, I, I mean, my original question was about the, 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 the lack of scientific evidence. What I think the whole, this debate has thrown up is, is a desperate need for more. Um, we, we, need more we need more science and research in, into this whole issue. But to, to, move, the, to move the debate on, the, the proposal within the review is that um, the sustainability issue should be addressed by introducing a licence to kill. Um, fish, uh, 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 killing wild salmon. And I pick up uh, greatly diverging opinions about this, um, not least because of the practicalities of applying for quota before the season has even begun. I think uh, Mr Young referred earlier to you know, the difficulty of doing that when you don't even know what kind of run you're going to have. Um, but I, I just wondered if um, what panellists would like to comment on the, the, this proposal to introduce a, a licence to kill um, and whether they think it will be effective in, um, in, in what it's setting itself out to do. I, and maybe you could, if anybody wants, you could touch on some of the practicalities, like how do you set the quota, how do you allocate it along a certain river? Um, and I'd just be really interested in what anybody's got to say about that. Right, we've got some other people who haven't spoken for a while. Uh, down here. You want to say something, Craig? Um, I think in, in Argyle, we, we have very few salmon. Our great asset in Argyle is, is sea trout. But for how a, a system would work, a quota system, which I think is a, a good thing. I mean, I think, by and large, the catch and release rate is very high in Argyle. Our largest catchment, the all catchment, which Sir Jamie has a bit on, is 98% uh, catch and release because we have so few salmon and we've been advocating a catch and release policy. We have a few rivers that refuse to engage in catch and release, which is a source of great frustration. And I think this quota system would be a way of bringing those, bringing those rivers, show, demonstrating to those rivers that scientific evidence is saying you need to put those fish back. For how it would work, it would be very... I think each proprietor would need to apply for a, a, a quota for their beat. That is the proposal. Yes, and I, I can't see it... I think to ask a, a central unit to... or, or the, indeed the local FMOs to do it would be... would spend an, take up an awful lot of time of the local FMOs' time if we were asked to distribute quotas. And it could, it could get very... It might, it might make an additional source of income if we were to auction them off. But uh, <laughs> it might uh, prove very difficult. Yeah. Um, am I waiting for a red light? Yes. Um, the, 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 the problem with the system is how would you determine the level of, of, of quota? Uh, and we haven't got a mechanism doing that because we don't know what the run would be on, on the tweet. The, the run can 
vary by up to three three times. We've had a run of about seven and a half thousand rod caught fish this year, whereas we've been up at twenty, well over twenty thousand. So, and you'd need to know that before the year to um, uh, to actually calculate the quota, and that that's the problem with the system. Um, uh, and then you have the practical problem of actually distributing the, the tags between the fisheries and then between the fishermen on the fisheries because you get different people coming in at different times of year, different times of the week, different days. Uh, so it could be an absolute logistic nightmare uh, and a very expensive one to um, introduce them. But I, I, I go back to my previous point. You, you need to know what level of attrition you're prepared to accept on a stock. So you need to know the size of the run. I'm agreeing with um, Mr. Russell again. You need to know the size of the stock so that you can determine what level of kill is acceptable. Um, and I don't think we've got the basis to do that. Okay. I think that kind of answers the points that you've made. Uh, I like Ferguson in terms of the difficulties that there are with this, but, you know, willingness to explore how it might be possible. Sorry. Continue yeah. to explore as we go forward, but I thank you for so that. Too. Thank you for that. I'd like to move on to Graham Day, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Before I do that, can I just correct the record that I think I said there would have been around 600 fish would have been killed in the South Esk, it would have been fewer than 190. Sometimes as I pass my arithmetic higher. Um, I'd like to get the panel's views on the proposal to create an offensive, reckless, or irresponsible management of fishing rights. Uh, get some thinking on what sort of conduct you think would appropriately be deemed to be. Uh, an offence, and how this would be enforced. And can we expand it out a little bit and look at a question I posed to Andrew Thin last week, which was, that should we have a fit and proper person test applied in relation to the granting of licences? OK, who wants to kick off on that one? Uh, Crispian Cook, have you got some thoughts? Thank you, Chairman. Um, um, I, I've thought about this um, from the perspective of um, the success that one would actually have of bringing an action successfully to a conclusion in a court um, and working back from there. Um, and my, my concern for those who would um, uh, support the idea is that I think that that would be extremely difficult. Um, looked at it in other walks of life, for example, certificates of bad husbandry and agriculture and things of that kind are, are terribly easy to say, but actually very difficult to do. The burden of proof... The, 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 the quality of the, the level of information. I mean, it may be that you would find uh, a situation that was, was very obvious, um, but equally you could find um, uh, a situation that was much more complicated to come to a conclusion on. Um, so I, I, have, I, have doubts, I have doubts about it, not because um, uh, perhaps one might have um, some... Uh, basic um, sympathy with uh, the, um, the ambitions of any um, angler or fisherman or legislator that, uh, that, that, that a fishery should be run well, um, but the actual m process of successfully bringing it uh, an action and bringing it to a conclusion I think would be uh, fraught with complication uh, and I'm not sure that uh, it would be necessarily very easy, for example, for a bailiff to understand the, um, uh, the full detail of it um, I, I hope that helps. James Guy. I, I, I would say the qualification to apply for a license would be that if you are a heritable title uh, on the rights to catch and throw killfish, I think you would. That would be your quantification of, of who can and who can. Uh, I would very much doubt if a, you could take it down to the individual angling clubs to apply. I think it would need to be the owners or the proprietors of a specific river that would do the applying, and then uh, they would designate it to the angling groups, etc. Uh, I would feel that would be the only fair way. Otherwise, you, could, you couldn't take what the police got and say, who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. Uh, you would just have to uh, 
to run it on what their, their heritable, if they, if they have a heritable title, I would see that they're duty bound then to get it. Had Graham Day. Sorry, I should maybe be clearer in terms of the fit and proper person test, because of course it is the riparian owners who would have to get the licence uh, for clarity. But um, I think it's an annual renewal of licences. So would it be appropriate that if an individual um, was deemed to be behaving irresponsibly, shall we say, uh, on the river, should there be a fit, fit and proper person test applied in relation to renewing that licence? Jerry Campbell Adamson. Um, it's something I haven't given a great thought to, but it's the idea of licensing, as has been discussed before about estates. Um, it's, it's obviously logical to a degree, but it's practically, as Christmas pointed out, pretty difficult. But if there's a crime committed by someone fishing on a river, I think the proprietor under vicarious liability obligation would be caught anyway. I, I just, before giving a real strong opinion about this, I think we'd have to look at scenarios of what is being done badly to justify it. I'm not quite sure where we go with that, but I, the principle, Graham, as you say, I think is absolutely right. I mean, in a way, if you have a public resource, as you quite rightly talked about salmon, going through and be very parochial about salmon only, yes, you have a responsibility, there's no doubt. Um, can I very quickly convene, I'm sorry, I'm going back to previously because I finished before I got the thing. The idea of licensing is, I think, hugely good idea. Can I say that? And I, I you know, I'd put for SNTA would certainly support it. Okay. Uh, sorry, I went back. You've felt you've got an answer yeah, to that. Yeah. Right, Sarah Boyack, please. Yeah. Um, I'd like to take us on to the issue of what we know about um, mixed stock fisheries. Um, one of the recommendations of the review was that any licence application should take into account um, the current knowledge regarding the conservation status of all the fish populations in the destination rivers, um, and that where appropriate, there should be a precautionary principle um, approach adopted. And the review recommended that where an approach would result in catches being significantly low, below current levels, reduction should be phased in to allow those affected to adjust. So I'm interested in both the lack of scientific knowledge and how you would um, address that issue. Have the proposals in the review come up with suggestions that would actually fill that gap in knowledge? And meantime, is it right that we should take a precautionary approach? Um, and particularly thinking about enabling us in Scotland to comply with our international obligations. OK, who wants to open up on that? Yes, Andre Walker. Thank you. Um, Sana takes a strong view that we should take a precautionary approach to salmon and sea trout throughout the whole of the country, not just in areas that are close to um, areas of particular um, status for, for conservation, because the whole conservation issue should cover everything. Um, we're certainly well aware of the international uh, connection in that, say, in Greenland or the Faroes, they're, they're, they're easily aware of what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and deciding what fisheries should go ahead and what shouldn't. So there, we have to be aware of that in taking account of sustainability and everything else. It's part of the, the discussion about whether it's allowable or not. We think that if you wind down somebody's fishery for conservation reasons, it, it shouldn't necessarily be sudden. It, it's a good idea to, if it was nets, for instance, to bring that down slowly because it may want to come up again if stocks start to recover. Um, so we're basically in favour of, of most of that. Any other comments on this just now? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, in that case, we'll have a short contribution on this, and then from James, and then from Huey. OK? Right. Well, I totally feel that it... Without scientific evidence, and this precautionary approach, precautionary approach is a very uh, easy used word, uh, and a precautionary approach could affect people like my living greatly uh, by somebody uh, closing down uh, or slowing or easing down what we can catch, because we need to catch an X amount of fish per year to survive. Uh, we are employing uh, locals, we're exporting out of the country. 95% of all salmon caught by nets, I could say, uh, from the major fisheries uh, in Scotland, and there's not many of us, uh, is going out to the UK. I personally put to France and Canada and all over, not great amounts, small amounts weekly, 
and I feel that our customers would also be let down and uh, it would need to be very much burden shading like it was, like I, Hugh will go back, as he said, we'll go back to the next work fisheries review that we were part of, so, and the recommendation 21 was that if there is a problem uh, with stock, it has to be burden sharing and equally burden sharing. So the participation in angling would have not, the catch and release would have to go out the door and participation would have to come equal. So um, because of the unknown quantities of going back. We're going over all ground because it's all tied up together, of course. So uh, it, would, it couldn't uh, be done without proper scientific evidence, uh, I would say. Thank you. Right. Huey? Yep. Just a quick one. I'd, um, I totally agree with totally, James. We, everyone has to uh, take the burden of trying to conserve our valuable stock, and I absolutely agree. We all have to, um, I think, stop killing so many fish. The NASCO question, uh, as far as I can say, is absolutely right. I've, I've been lucky enough to attend NASCO for the last um, five or six years. It's quite clear Scotland's not behind the curve now with its, um, its lack of policy on mixed stock fisheries. Um, our problem in Scotland is we can't, we can't satisfy what NASCO asks in their guidelines, which is quite clear, that no fishery should exploit from a river you can't prove there's a surplus on. Well, unfortunately, as Nick has pointed out, it's impossible to really know what surpluses we have in Scotland because we have too many classes of fish going up each river, so you might have a lack of spring fish, as clearly we have, and therefore, how do you do it? It's, it's a hugely difficult a job and Marine Scotland Science have fought over this for years trying to find a way. I personally think we're not going to be able to find a way that suits even with genetics. So we're never really going to satisfy NASCO's um, wishes to see quite clearly that mixed stock fisheries do not persecute from any, uh, take from any river that can't sustain. I would go further and say there's a lot of rivers in Scotland that probably can't sustain and this is what I hope the licence to kill will, will come up with. Where will be a problem with the licensing to kill is how do you define from a mixed stock fishery which river it's coming from. So you put a quote on a river. The whole thing is open to problems. But let's just go back to the basics and the whole thing. I hope we're all here for one reason. One, here, one reason here to protect our salmon runs. And our salmon runs in the last 30 years have collapsed. And collapse is a very strong word, but we've seen going from 30-odd percent of smilts coming back in the 60s and 70s down to less than 3% case now. We've got a major, major problem. And I just think we should really not too worry about taking sides in all this and realise what the big problem is. We are killing too many fish. Or everyone's killing too many fish. James Mackay. Yeah. Um, I, I, would go, I would disagree because I honestly know myself. From 2010 um, onwards, uh, we are above what our average was... Uh, uh, per year. In 2010, we broke the record probably for our middle in its history of probably 200 years. So we don't have, I don't have readily figures for our middle for as far back as that, but I have figures going back to the 30s for our middle that I could produce to anybody that wants them eventually. Uh, and I would go on to say that the there's, there's no an issue with stock. I think there's certainly an issue with springs stock. But for summer stock, there's no one issue. There's, I think the problem is, is global climate change, droughts in rivers. If you have plenty of water in your rivers, you would have plenty of fish to catch on the end of your roads. So the issue is not with uh, what's happening on, uh, with netting. And the other issue is what's happening over here in my head about the parapet is so I don't think anybody's going there uh, on that one in any subject because it's such a, a delicate subject. But I think this we wouldn't be here if we hadn't that problem. Okay, so we've got the points of view on that. Uh, can we leave it at that just now? Because the next bit follows on very much about scientific advice on wild fisheries. Uh, so Angus MacDonald. Uh, thanks, Convener. It's certainly been a, a fascinating uh, debate so far. Um, and it's clear from the, the previous discussion uh, on sustainable harvesting that we, we need to uh, reduce the number of gaps in the, the knowledge base. Um, now, we, we know the review considered the scientific evidence uh, base to support wild fisheries management, uh, and it's recommended a number of areas where research is needed in the short to medium term. Um, now, you'll, you'll all have read the review, um, so I won't detail all the suggestions, but I will mention just a couple 
Um, clearly, there's the salmon-related data for reporting to NASCO and the EU. Uh, habitat productivity, resilience and enhancement potential for all species. Um, impacts on sea trout and salmon survival in the Scottish marine environment and um, potential threats to wild fisheries populations. Um, now, the review also recommended that the, the national unit should develop standards for fisheries management. And when we took evidence from the review panel uh, last week, they identified the opportunity afforded by creating FMOs uh, to rationalise the, the number of DSFBs and fisheries trusts and also the opportunity to make more resources available for research. So can I ask the panel what views uh, the, the, the members have on the need for research to, research to support wild fisheries uh, management in Scotland? And do you agree with the research priorities identified uh, within the review? OK. Research priorities. Ron. Yep, Ron Woods. Sorry. Um, just before we totally leave the uh, sustainable harvesting section... Um, How could we can, possibly? Uh, I, 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 I uh, would draw attention to the fact that, as far as I could hear, nothing was mentioned that didn't concern salmon. Um, uh, as far as coarse fish are concerned, I make no comment in relation to brown trout or, or other salmonids, but as far as coarse fish are concerned, our position is quite clear, 100% catch and release, and no form of harvesting whatsoever. Um, uh, and particularly, and this bears on, on, on what we've moved on to, because there is a total absence of data on what would be sustainable. We have, as a matter of principle, uh, a belief in catch and release, but even if we didn't believe in catch and release, it would be irresponsible, following the precautionary principle that's been mentioned already, to allow continued exploitation of that resource without good sound data to know what exploitation is sustainable. And at the moment, that data doesn't exist. For that reason, I think the, uh, uh, the priority list that's, uh, that's set out in Recommendation 37 should contain uh, a need for resource on uh, resource research rather on the um, dynamics of coarse fish populations, especially pike, which is the species which probably has the most fragile population. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think perhaps the, uh, the issue about basic mapping of Scotland's wider all species resource may not be quite such a priority. I believe there was work done on that about 10 or 12 years ago by uh, uh, the uh, Freshwater Fisheries Laboratory people, and I don't think personally, I may be wrong, uh, that the data that was collected then will be substantially different if that exercise was repeated today. Other points on that? Nick Young? Um, well, undoubtedly, um, we, the, the basic amount of information that's required to uh, run a fishery is absolutely paramount. Uh, and um, we, on well, the Tweed, have invested heavily in that in the last years, and I think all other rivers should do the same. Of course, they're not able to, which is the problem. Um, the, uh, one thing that will influence that is that it will be different in each area. There will be different types of information that will be required on different rivers and in, and in different areas. And that's why, um, whilst there needs to be a national strategy, uh, what's actually implemented locally will have to be decided locally because there will be different uh, influences, there will be different effects, different stocks of fish in different areas. So um, it very much has to be on a location-by-location on a location basis. Um, the recommendation wisely says should include, <laughs> because those are indeed some of the things that it should include. I, I think there's some of there that perhaps don't need to be included, but uh, it should certainly include that, and may well include other things in other areas, um, but may not include some of those things in some areas. Um, For example, what should it not include? Well, th there is a recommendation there about um, uh, uh, quantifying the effectiveness and catch and release. Well, that has actually been done, and we, we know the effectiveness of that and we can pr provide evidence on that. So that, for example, on our river doesn't actually need to be done. It might need to be on other rivers, or okay. scientists may say you can extrapolate between the two. But, um. Fine. Angus, any? Yeah, well, just following on from, from Nick Young's point, um, uh, with regard to uh, differences in, in, in different regions and different localities, um, what scope will FMOs they have to carry out research uh, compared to the existing boards and fisheries trusts. 
anyone? If MOs as proposed, would they be able to conduct this, or are we looking for some other? Yeah, uh, Jamie. Would, I would hope so. I think it's absolutely essential if these FMOs are to work, then, then, then they can. I mean, most officially trust work and the boards undertake local focus research already. Um, the, the idea of being part of a sort of wide, wider overarching organisation would have some advantage to do with some, some of the things like sea survival where, where, where we should be expecting there's a, a, a common uh, survival rates across larger parts of Scotland. But some of that acidification, which is a big issue for us, you know, we have 65% of acidification in Scotland. It's a huge issue. It's the main limiting factor in our rivers. And that's one of the things where we keep trying to push to ensure that FMOs can still look at these localised um, issues um, and focus down on them. So, so you, you need this, this sort of double, double, double um, ability. Just going back to your question, you were picking up on, on, on some of the key things. I mean, marine survival, absolutely key. We need to be understanding more about whether that's getting worse, whether it's starting to balance out, because it under, undermines a huge amount of work. And if, if it's continuing to get worse, is it stabled out? Um, the, ha the habitat potential, um, which I think was, was one of the points, is actually key as well. If you're looking at the benefits overall in Scotland, where funding should go to, then you need to understand exactly what habitat restoration in what places are, are, are like to give you the main benefits. And these are the sorts of things I think that the research needs to start to look at. We had a similar thing with the barrier assessment uh, work for, for the SEPA funding for barriers. Instead of just relying on different trusts to come up with barriers. It was trying to come up with a ranking of where Scotland benefit the most from that. And these are the sort of key underarching things that I think need to come under there. Um, potential threats, um, I, I think that's absolutely key. One of the things is to look at things like um, changes of, of land use and, and what's like to come through, you know, things like increased hydro, potential of increased deforestation. It's trying to understand, okay, what's the potential of things going forward? Because most of these we can address easily at the time if we understand them the high cost is going in afterwards to try and address them so i think you know i think if we can focus on these <coughs> these key areas from my point of view they, they would give the best bang for buck jamie mcgregor well just on the subject of marine survival i absolutely agree that i think there has to be far more um research and development done into that um it does strike me that if you look at other species of fish mackerel for example the vast numbers of mackerel which are now in Icelandic waters and being caught in Icelandic waters, which weren't there before, are all chasing the same food as the salmon are chasing. And, and I think, you know, that the, there has to be more research into, into what, you know, for example, why is it that many, great many rivers on the West Coast have lost their grills runs, particularly, um, which make up the bulk of, um, you, you know, the, 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 what people refer to as the salmon runs. Um, the, the, you know, it's, it's all very well saying we can do it from the, from the end of, you know, sitting on the bank and sitting on the, on, on the land. What's happening at sea is, is, is it needs to be looked at far more uh, so that we get a, a, a true picture. We've got that picture, I think, absolutely, yes. Craig McIntyre, finally on this point. OK, uh, thank you. Um, just going back to the, the point about habitat productivity and habitat potential, that's absolutely something that currently fisheries trusts and boards undertake that work, and that's something that is, is key to carry on. We have, in Argyle, we have over, well, we've surveyed over 100 different catchments, so it can be very difficult to collect all that data properly. I think the point I would like to make is it's all very well identifying what the areas are, but currently fisheries trusts and boards could do with help with accessing funds to actually make the improvements and realise the potential, that's where we're currently lacking. And that's where I hope that uh, a national unit would be able to assist FMOs in actually making the changes and reaching our potential. OK, thank you for that. I think we'll try to move into regulation and compliance and so on to help this happen. Uh, Graham Day. Thank you, Kivira. I just wonder if, if um, witnesses feel there's a need to extend the annual close time for salmon fisheries in the spring beyond those that were recently legislated for. Definitely. Um, I think this, uh, the, the present legislation to the 1st of April is very, very limited in, in 
Galloway, where, where, where I obviously work, uh, where the spring fisheries are, most of those rivers are all, have all closed the rivers to at least the 1st of June. Um, so they haven't closed the rivers, sorry, 100% catch and release up to, up to the, the 1st of June, uh, in recognition that particularly in dry years that these spring fish are likely to be caught in the, in the lower river. Um, there doesn't seem to be any, any great opposition to that. There never has been. And I think I, I'm disappointed it's a lost opportunity that, that could have been pulled forward to the 1st of June, the present legislation. James Kai. Okay. Members, we couldn't sustain to be starting anything later than the 1st of April. Um, I would go to see if there's restraints, it would have to be done on the Anglian side, because as again, repeating myself, uh, I'll go to say that the fish that goes into the river systems, spring fish that's been caught and released in, in the, up to April, is still being harvested right through the summer. Uh, that's a spring stock. So as far as netting's concerned, uh, we certainly would oppose, or if we could oppose it, and uh, right so to, to have it any further than where we have it. Because our season is, is very short in comparison to the angling season. So there's issues with that that we looked at, um, that we're hoping for maybe move on to something like days at sea, and then probably we, it could be altered and we could we could, with our quota or our license system that we could probably still catch the same amount of fish but obviously shift the season on it's getting to, so it, if you caught your quota or your license number by the end of July well you're finished for your season and uh, if you didn't catch your quota system or, or your license as whatever way we want to call it you, you would fish on until you maybe caught it uh, when there was a harvest of surplus of fish around. So I think it's for the future, uh, once the next part of this comes in, be, before that could be, I would imagine, be uh, looked at. Right, um, Huey Campbell Adamson, and then I want to move on. Very briefly, Convener of May, I think you probably were the petitions committee are putting a petition that the SNTA has put forward. Yes. 8,000 signatures saying until the 1st of July, and that will be dealt with. So that's, that's our views. Um, well, we'll see how that uh, progresses. I want to ask a question just before I bring in Sarah Boyack about numbered carcass tagging, uh, which is one of the things that's been proposed. Uh, we've visited as a committee uh, with uh, Sam and Netsman before this with their own tagging system, but it's not a numbered carcass tagging system. Yeah, that's the, uh, the ones that you've used, yeah, indeed. But we've uh, seen that in times, I'm sure. <laughs> we would we like uh, the panel's views about the idea of having a numbered Sorry, system, Nikki. which is organised so that uh, whether it's a kill on a river or indeed a kill through net catching, uh, should be the way forward. Yes. Nick. Um, well, I can speak with a little bit of experience on this one because we did actually do a trial on it on the Tweed several years ago. Um, the only system that will work is a, a numbered system that's linked back to a, a record book uh, with those numbers in the record book for each fish caught. Um, and anything else simply won't work. It's what's used in um, the rest of Britain uh, and it, it would have to be uh, a numbered system. I think there's another reason doing, for doing it too, not just for um, uh, compliance with, with quotas or anything else. I, um, I, my history is in another part of the food sector, and, and consumers do actually want some uh, assurances about what they're, what they're buying and where they bought it from. And I would have thought it was massively in the interests of, um, well, certainly the consumer, but also of the supplier too. Uh, to actually be able to show that a fish has come from a particular place on a particular day. Um, and it's a huge marketing opportunity, so I would have thought it's a win for everybody. OK, uh, I think that's fair. Uh, Sarah Boyack. Yeah, I want to orders. pick up the issue of the um, protection orders. Uh, the review said that they thought it was important to have protection orders, but that the system needed... Um, an overhaul. So they've put together a package of reforms and I'm interested in the panel's views on whether we should keep the protection order system um, 
and whether you support the recommendations and the modifications recommended by the review. And a, an additional question, um, once you've considered that, is to ask whether you agree that the protection orders are necessary to protect fish populations or whether you think there might be instances in which they're used to prevent access to fishing. Mm -hmm. Okay, who wants to answer that? Protection orders of... It's unfortunate the gentleman from the Tay board is not here because the House historically been issues in that area. But what about protection orders in other parts? Are there protection orders in your area? So, yes. Okay. Andy's from the Tay, of course. Or? Well, I'm from the Tay system, anyway, yes. Uh, is the Tumulgari protection order separate from the main Tay? So we haven't been under any threat so far from people saying that it's not been run properly. But these protection orders do drift over time. New proprietors come in and they, they have to be made aware, if they don't know already, of the rules of the protection order. And quite often, complacency seeps in, and you do need to review these things every year. Um, there, there needs to be a decent review from the centre, from, from government or from, from the FMOs, to make sure that these things are working. At the moment, it seems to be silence. We're not even being asked for our, our liaison committee reports just now because of the fisheries review. So... Um, Underlying all this is the feeling I have, and many others, probably the majority of SANA, that protection order system is too piecemeal. We've only covered about half of the country in all these years that it's been in operation. We need something more national, surely. But if we have to stick with the protection order, they can be made to work, but they need a lot of attention. That's a good summary. Do you, we, all, we all agree about that, simply. Yeah. Yeah. Craig? Yeah, I'd just like to make a point that um, one of the big advantages of the protection order is to criminalise illegal fishing. And we have a situation in Argyll where we have, a, we have Loch Awe, which has a protection order, and it works well. For, it enables wardens to police it. We have another loch, Loch Eck, which is a site of special scientific interest. There's no protection order, there's no protection, and it's overfished, and the fish stocks are declining. And the local anglers, the local anglers feel such frustration that... Nothing can be done about it. If you catch somebody illegal fishing, they don't, don't need to give their name. So I think some of the, the protection that a protection order gives would be very welcome if it were simplified. Right. Uh, Jamie McGregor, Ron Woods, and then Dave Thompson, the supplementary in this. Yep. Well, as I said earlier, I've been chairman of a, a protection order for, for, um, uh, of the Loch Awe Improvement Association, which runs the protection order since 1992. Um, uh, and not, uh, I've just found it difficult to get anyone else to do it, which is a point that I would like to make. These things rely to an enormous extent on voluntary management yep. and, and volunteers. And I think whatever is done, that should be borne in mind, because um, who is going to pay for If it's, everything's going to be made, you know, something has to be paid for, who is going to pay for it? Um, the other thing is that protection orders only deal with non-migratory species, i.e. they don't deal with, they deal with salmon and sea trout, they do not deal with brown trout, uh, sorry, they do deal with brown trout and coarse fish, they don't deal with salmon and sea trout, and that can lead to difficulties over management, uh, especially when you're talking about environmental enhancement and all that sort of thing, because what, what, you know, what's good for salmon and sea trout can also be extremely good for brown trout as well. Um, and I think the, the last point I'd like to make is that um, they're not perfect, but the, 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 they are not a bad thing. But certainly, Loch Awe has, you know, the, the whole environment of Loch Awe, I would say most people would agree, has improved dramatically since 1992 in, respect, in many respects. But there are lots of holes and anomalies within protection orders, which I won't go into now, which could easily be improved. Well, that's very helpful indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron Woods? Um, I think I, I would want to start by saying that we are absolutely on board to the underlying principle that was the foundation of protection orders. The idea that there is a, a, a bargain, if you will, that res responsible access for angling in a sustainable fashion should be granted and in return proprietors, uh, riparian owners, should be able to expect the full protection of the criminal law. 
Having said that, I totally agree with what Andy has said. We've, we've had this legislation for uh, 40 years, perhaps, something of that order. It doesn't cover the whole country. The actual practices within protection order, or as between protection orders, vary enormously. Um, LOCO, and I'm not saying this just because I'm sitting next to Jamie, uh, LOCO is in many senses an ideal example of how it works. There is good liaison, there is good bargaining, etc. But it's by far um, uh, not the norm. Um, we have a waters within protection order areas where there are some riparian owners actively encouraging the killing of coarse fish. Um, we have waters within some protection order areas where methods restrictions, which is, uh, I'll not go off tangentially to explain that in detail, but suffice it to say that coarse fishing involves certain practices and methods which are not necessarily the same as those used by game anglers. And the method restrictions actually uh, reduce access in practical sense for coarse anglers. Um, I think it's a philosophical point whether protection orders uh, whether the amount of change that would be required to make the protection order system work still could be called a protection order system. In our view, there needs to be a universal system which applies across the country and which contains those fundamental principles of responsible access, protection of the criminal law and sustainability of use of the resource. And I don't think personally and, and from the SFS CA perspective, we don't think you would call that protection orders. It's, it would it require much larger scale fundamental change to Scottish angling legislation. Well, the point of us taking evidence is to be able to make a report that allows us to comment on these things, and yes. that's, that's also very valuable just now. Um, Sarah, are you happy with that so far? Very much. Thank you. That's great. Um, Mike Russell, uh, another question about uh, river um, management. Yes, I think there has been concern expressed in certainly in the questioning last week, to the recommendation and report about bailiffs and the fact that there was felt that the bailiffs, the police evidence was that bailiffs were not using the powers that they had and that therefore those powers were not uh, required. I think the, uh, the, the concern is in two parts. One part for those people like myself, I have to say, and I think Mr Thompson, who are concerned about some of the ways in which bailiffs do exercise their rights, and perhaps some people who believe that bailiffs are uh, required to be strengthened in their role. I pointed to the experience of the Loch Lomond and Trossach National Park, where they have found a very useful adjunct to enforcing some of the bylaws, which allows rangers to be sworn in as special constables, and actually gives them a legal function. And my concern with the system of bailiffs we have at the moment is very often bailiffs operate on, uh, under regulation and under uh, law, but not with the same rigour in terms of the observation of the law that you would get from a special constable. So I'm looking, if there are ideas around this table, for any ideas from people who might have a better way of managing this system so it could fit within the existing legal structures and be understood in that way. Because I think, taking an environmental parallel, there are other examples in the art environment where uh, there's at least a shade of grey in how uh, regulations are enforced, imposed or monitored by those who do not have full statutory authority. James Mackay. Well, I feel that bailiffs should actually be uh, trained, and uh, I think it might be in the proposal somewhere along the line, but be trained as a, in a central body, all singing from the same hymn sheet, if I might use the word, but I get all get a... Uh, equally trained, like the police, that they're, they have the same powers, the same laws, and everything's within their system. And also, there should be a, an accountability side to that, that if, if, the, if they break the code of practice, then that there should be somebody that would uh, take it to task and obviously sort it out, like, with, fair, with a, fair, like a fair tribunal thing. Uh, like the police, obviously, if, they, if any of them break their code of practice, uh, they're taken to task by somebody, uh, maybe outside the police authority. So I think that should be in place. Um, so, that's, so that everybody knows where they are with, with bail of union, and it could be a, a written code of practice for everybody to know their legal rights and what to have, because every bail of, I think, has their own pretty much on the same par, but they have their different training and they, they come from different uh, directions. Thank you. 
Uh, Huey Campbell Adamson. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's. Uh, I, I presume everyone knows that the, to be a bailiff, you have to go through the IFM exam to be a recognised bailiff. So at least there's some sort of centra, central training. The role of bailiffs, I think, has changed quite a lot in the last 10 years, 15 years, the policing side of it, because as long as you have a good relationship with local police and the wildlife officer, it's become less important. The bailiff is now doing much more in the way of the scientific work as a servant in the way of the board. But I, I do understand the misgivings people have of a private army, as some people think they are. I think that's an unfair criticism because most bailiffs, bailiffs I know, and I have to put my hand up, I'm a qualified bailiff, um, I think we're all pretty responsible, but there may be one or two wrong ones, and I accept that there may be a need for more central control. I'm not trying to prolong this discussion, but uh, you know, if we can focus in on the, the, the sense of the question, you know, about yeah, Jamie. It's, it's more. It's more sort of comment. Um, you know, when people talk about bailiffs and and, and so sort of armies of bailiffs and such like that, that particularly over in the West, um, it's mostly voluntary bailiffs. Um, there is, as you had touched on, there is a, a training programme association of DS, DSFBs overseas, so, so, so these bailiffs are going through a level of training. But at the moment, the, the sort of bailing, bailiffing resource costs next to nothing. Um, I, I'm, I'm unaware any bailiffs that go over about 500 quid a year, um, and there's only a few that get that in, in the sort of southwest Scotland to cover wellies and mileage and stuff like that. I mean, at the moment, the bailiffing resource in many areas is run very, very cheaply. Um, again, more as a comment, a lot of the recommendations, or some of the recommendations, things like road licence, quotas, um, may obviously change the requirement, the number of bailiffs in, in, required in different places. That, and, and I just wonder whether or not sort of voluntary bailiffs will easily be able to keep that, that, level, that level of work up if they expect to do that on top of um, everything else. OK, Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, I mean, obviously, one of the, the key issues here, as I identified last week, is, is accountability. And uh, the statement from Police Scotland that bailiffs rarely use the powers that they have now. And, and, and that just sort of strikes me that if these powers are not being used, and I know from personal experience and knowledge that in the past they were overused uh, and, and quite a draconian fashion at times, and I accept that things have, uh, have moved on, but if these powers are no longer needed and if a lot of the bailiffs are dealing with environmental issues and all the rest of it, then it strikes me we do need to look fundamentally at the accountability, the qualification and the powers uh, of bailiffs. If we're going to retain a bailiff system rather than using... I mean, I think the, um, the, the committee last week um, did agree that it was somewhat bizarre there was a separate police force for fishing. But if we're going to have that, I think we need to fundamentally look at, at all of those issues. And I would appreciate views around the table in relation to that. I see it very few views about it. <laughs> because I think uh, we should be here hungry? all day. But I take your point that we need some views about how it should be managed, and that was what the original question was. I quite agree. Uh, right, Jamie McGregor, Just quickly, very briefly. Very briefly. Um, protection order systems have wardens rather than bailiffs, and although the, the wardens can be made into bailiffs if they have to work on, on uh, yep. migratory species, and uh, I think that the committee should look at the difference between wardens and bailiffs. That's very helpful. Does anyone have anything to add to that particularly? Yes, Crispian. Uh, in respect to the um, comments um, uh, just before Mr. Um, Ms. McGregor about the, um, uh, the fact that bailiffs may not use the full extent of their powers um, in certain remote areas of Scotland, um, uh, you can find yourself with a with a, with a, with a problem um, as a bailiff, that whereas you may find yourself in a position where an alleged offence has been committed, uh, you may have a power of arrest, but actually you are in a position where you might also find yourself uh, on the wrong side of the law by trying to present that um, alleged um, criminal um, to the police because you've got to put them into your own car and drive for an hour to find the nearest police station. Um, so I, I, I would just make that point in comment to uh, response to the comments That's on our right. Possibly very helpful for Mr Thompson indeed. Are there any other points here from people who want to comment on? We've had, well, 
I have to say, uh, it gives us lots of food for thought. Uh, and I think uh, the past experiences, particularly that we can think about uh, where bailiffs have been over powerful and uh, indeed with the qualification that of course in remote areas it's more difficult to handle these things. We should be uh, uh, able to take those on board with the written and your oral evidence in our report that we will draw up and in the questions that we ask uh, further on this matter. I'd like to thank everybody for their contribution today. All of it is very helpful. It has been uh, conducted in a consensual fashion given that there are obvious spikes uh, between some views and, and others. But uh, you've all uh, risen to the occasion and I thank you very much for that. We're going to close the meeting just now by pointing out that on the 4th of March, the committee will consider subordinate legislation as well as taking further evidence of the Wild Fisheries Review from the Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and consider stage two amendments to the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. I now close the meeting.